وَإِن تَعْجَبْ فَعْجَبٌ قَوْلُهُمْ أَيْذَا كُنَّا تُرَابًا أَيْنَّا لَفِي خَلْقٍ جَدِيدٍ أُولَئِكَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا بِرَبِّهِمْ وَأُولَئِكَ الْأَغْلَالُ فِي أَعْنَاقِهِمْ وَأُولَئِكَ أَصْحَابُ النَّارِ فِيهَا خَالِدُونَ الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم Ustaz Muhammad Tim Hambo, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakallah khairan once again for joining me on the Hot Seat Podcast. Wa yakum, it's always a pleasure. Barakallah fiqh. So as you know, it's a show where we usually discuss controversial topics within the religion of Islam. And this, like many that we've discussed b- before previously, um, is one that has particularly been on the minds of a lot of Muslims and non-Muslims for that matter of fact uh, in the last few years. And that is related to the penal code of Islam, the Sharia law. And we want to find out today and answer the question, is the Sharia barbaric? So as I often do, I normally give you the opportunity to have your introduction. You can lay down some principles, some uh, points that we can perhaps refer back to throughout the discussion. Over to you. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen wa salatu wa salam ala abdillahi wa rasulih nabiyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. It's really interesting that in that introduction, the way the term Sharia is used. So I want to start by just looking at this word Sharia because mm. I believe that the the beginning of the problem here is actually the misunderstanding of the word Sharia and the misuse of the word Sharia. Not say that there aren't. I'm sure we're going to come across many valid points during our discussion sure. that need to be discussed. But I believe the premise that we're beginning with that the Sharia is this Islamic penal code. Uh, I think the word Sharia, we need to go right back. Okay. So Allah Azza wa Jal said, لِكُلِّنْ جَعَلْنَا مِنْكُمْ شِرْعَةً وَمِنْهَاجَ To each of you, we prescribed a shir'a, a sharia, a law, and a method. And Allah Azza wa Jal said, أَمْ لَهُمْ شُرَكَا شَرَعُوا لَهُمْ مِنَ الدِّينِ مَا لَمْ يَأْذَنْ بِهِ اللَّهِ Do they have partners that have legislated for them from, from this from their religion things which Allah has not given permission mm-hmm. for in the arabic language the word sharia is actually a watering place a place of water and it's a place where the water is open and apparent not like a well where you have to dig right okay. down and find yeah. it but say like the bank of a river okay and when you go down to the bank of the river and you sort of descend down with your animals and you sit by the bank of the river and your animals drink from the water. That's what the word Sharia means in the Arabic language. So it is a word that is actually very positive in Arabic. Mm -hmm. And some of the ulama, they mentioned the link between the linguistic and between the the application of Sharia as a, a system of law, a comprehensive system of law, is that just like water is an essential element for life, so the law, of Allah and the rules and regulations that we live by are essential for our eternal life. So it's a path that leads you to eternal life. It's a path that leads you to eternal happiness. That's the concept of the word Sharia. The word itself is not a a negative, harsh word. There are words like that. We talk about jinayat, you know, punishments, and we talk about hudud, you know, prescribed penalties. The word had is a very sharp, hard, rough word, you know. But the word sharia is a very soft, beautiful word that talks about, you know, you get this image of, you know, sitting by the, 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 you know, the lake with your animals drinking from the water. This is what the word sharia means. And the word sharia in Islam was used in three ways. Okay. It was used for the religion as a whole, the whole religion. I mean, the, the, the whole of Islam would be called Sharia, because what is the feature of the whole of Islam? That Allah is the one who revealed it. Mm -hmm. Allah is the one who legislated it. And that's why we don't say about the Prophet ﷺ that he is Sharia, that he's the legislator. We actually, the Prophet ﷺ is Mubaldir. His job is to convey the legislation from Allah. But Allah is the legislator and everything that Allah legislated, including including Birr al-Walidayn, is Sharia. Being good to your parents, being kind to your neighbors, 
uh, being just, being fair, saying a good word to people, mm. tayyibah, saying a, a, a nice, nice things to people. All of this is sharia, the whole of the sharia from what Allah Azza wa legislated for us to follow. It's a very comprehensive. A comprehensive term. The second way they use the word sharia is aqidah. Okay. Like Imam Al-Ajurri, rahimahullah ta'ala in kitab al-sharia, he used the word sharia to refer to your beliefs. Uh-huh. That was well known as a terminology. Many of the scholars, they referred to beliefs as sharia. And some of them referred to the furu' fiqhiyah, the subsidiary matters of fiqh, uh, legislative matters like how to pray, how to fast, uh, how to marry, you know, all of these matters, they referred to them as sharia. But nobody from the scholars of Islam to the best of my knowledge that I have found, has ever used the word sharia to refer to punishments exclusively. It just wasn't used. This is something that Western newspapers, yeah. people like that took on, they put it in the saying, this Islamic sharia, sharia law. And in reality, this idea of sharia either refers to the whole religion, or it refers to all of the ahkam, or it refers to a person's belief. And it's not necessarily a a negative word. Instead, what the scholars referred to in terms of the prescribed punishments or penalties or the uh, the sort of laws of things like retribution, yeah. they refer to it either as al-hudud, which are prescribed punishments. And the word had is something which is delimited. It's been fixed, right? It's been set by Allah. So the set punishments that Allah has set. Mm. And some of them refer to it as al-jinayat, the law of punishments and penalties and things like that. Now, I also want to point out, which uh, a lot of people probably don't realize, is how small the penalties and punishments actually are in terms of the the amount of content Islam revealed, ayat, uh, hadith, uh, content within the books of fiqh. Okay, yeah. The penalties and punishments of Islam are a few pages in comparison to huge amounts about how to pray, about how to fast. about. So I want people to put it in context. I don't think we should run away from, and I don't want to run away, so I came to hot seat, you know. <laughs> we don't want to run away from discussing the penalties and punishments in Islam. But for someone to take something which is a tiny part of Islam and to make the whole of Islam, and the only thing Muslims do is cut off people's hands and heads. And that's the, that is why Islam was sent. Then that is... Uh, a, a really a gross misre- misrepresentation of the religion of Islam and what Islam is about. I also wanted to start by talking about how Allah sent the Messenger Muhammad وسلم, as he said, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ We sent you as a mercy for mankind. Islam was not sent to punish people. And I, that is that was not the, the maqasid of Islam. The purpose of Islam was not to punish people. Allah Azza wa Jal, when his punishment comes, like the punishment of Ad and Thamud and Fir'aun and the punishment of the people who came before, that, that punishment, when it comes, there is nobody getting out. Nobody comes out of that alive. Nobody comes out of that. You know, the punishment of Allah Azza wa Jal is severe when it comes. Islam was not sent to punish people. Islam was not sent to torture people. Islam was sent to bring mercy to people. And I think it's really important to look at what Islam generally from an overview came with. It came to protect the people's religion. And when we say to protect the people's religion and to preserve a tawheed, the oneness of Allah, to preserve and protect people's religion, to protect people's lives, to protect people's sanity and intellect, to protect people's health and to protect people's wealth and to protect people's honor. That's what Islam came with. And that necessitates that there are punishments. And I think that this idea that we shouldn't punish anyone for anything is a wholly false idea, which leads to a loss of life. Mm -hmm. It leads to a loss of safety. It leads to a loss of people's religion. And it causes great problems. There has to be, there have to be uh, dissentives, there have to be punishments. And I think also when we talk about worldly punishments, you have to also think that the punishment of Allah, I mean, the, the worldly punishments, no matter how, what level they reach, they will not reach the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
And that is something that all Muslims, we agree upon unanimously. And indeed, many, many other uh, religions, Christianity, Judaism, etc. also uh, agree about the severity of the punishment of Allah Azza wa Jal. And the fact that Allah Azza wa Jal, إِنَّ بَطَشَ رَبِّكَ لَشَدِيدٌ The punishment of your Lord is severe. And so whatever happened from, from the worldly punishments, you have to put that in context of the fact that in the hereafter, the situation will be far worse. So in terms of bringing things that stop people from falling into the greater punishment by giving them dissentives that disincentivize them from going into things that would lead them to that greater punishment is in itself a rahmah. And yeah. for example, the statement of Allah Azza wa Jal, hayatun ya ulil albabi la'allakum tattaqun you have in the in the law of qisas of retribution you have life that's really you know it's it's a really profound statement that that there we save people's lives through qisas that's what the ayah says people's lives are saved through qisas qisas being retribution retribution the, so. you know that the a life for a life mm. how can you have a life for a life and save people's yeah. lives. There are a number of ways, and, and we can get into the details of it later, but I just wanted to give that sort of sure. overview. Yeah. That, for example, the fact that this as a deterrent stops people from committing crimes. And so it saves the lives of those people who would have been victims and the lives of those people who would have had punishments carried yeah. out upon them. So in that sense, and in the sense of the fact that it preserves the, the safety and security of the community and the life of the community in general and the life of the hereafter as well. So I think all of those things need to be uh, need to be taken into uh, account. From the things that I want to begin with in the introduction is I really want to emphasize that for us as Muslims, our job is to submit to what Allah has legislated. There are times when we fully appreciate uh, or we feel that we fully appreciate. I think mm -hmm. it's probably incorrect yeah. to say we fully appreciate, but we have a reasonable appreciation of why we're being asked to do something. And there are times where there may be people who are watching, some of us understand it and some of us don't. And it's interesting in the ayah I mentioned about Qisas, yeah. Allah Azza wa Jalla said, Ya ulil albab, people of intellect. So that shows you that there are going to be people who understand that there is, that Qisas saves lives. Mm -hmm. And there are going to be people who don't understand but ultimately, as Allah Azza wa Jalla said, فَلَا وَرَبِّكَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ حَتَّى يُحَكِّمُوكَ فِي مَا شَجَرَ بَيْنَهُمْ ثُمَّ لَا يَجِدُوا فِي أَنفُسِهِمْ حَرَجًا مِمَّا قَضَيْتَ وَيُسَلِّمُ تَسْلِيمًا Allah Azza wa Jalla said in Surah An-Nisa, By your Lord, they do not believe until they make you the judge between them in that which they differ over. And then they don't find any discomfort any haraj, they don't find any discomfort in what you have ruled for them and they submit with complete submission. Now, at this point, it's interesting. I, I normally, I don't think I've ever done this on the hot seat. I typically don't quote non-Muslim uh, non sources yeah, because okay. my job is to present the Islamic side. Yeah. But I think in this, there's something that I really wanted to quote to you from, from non-Muslim sources. I wanted to talk about what how non-Muslims typically generally see the concept of punishment. And this is something when I did when I did law at A level, we looked at what the purpose of punishment and, and they call the purposes of sentencing. Like why do why do do, the, do countries or why do legal systems punish people? Yeah. And I just thought it's interesting to quote because it's interesting to think about that in the light of Islam, not as an evidence because it, it's not an Islamic sure, statement, yeah. but just to give some context as to typically why punishments are carried out. So the primary punish purposes of punishment are deterrence, both general and specific. So that is deterring the individual from committing the crime again mm -hmm. and deterring others from committing that crime. Okay. Followed by retribution. In other words, payback, uh, on behalf of the victim, on behalf of those people who have been affected. They said that every punishment in every legal system is based upon this. These two are unanimous in all legal systems, that there is deterrence and there is retribution. Then consideration is given to incapacitation, mm -hmm. stopping the person from being able to do it, 
rehabilitation, mm -hmm. facilitating the person to rehabilitate and restitution, in other words, giving back to the victim what was taken, depending on the crime. But those last three are not features of every punishment in every Fine. legal system. Okay. They are things that some crimes, there is consideration for, for incapacitating the person. For in some, there is an effort, more of an effort to rehabilitate. In some, there is restitution. In some, there isn't restitution. But all punishments are based around deterrence of the individual and of the society and retribution. So that's, I would argue that only Islamic law really achieves this in a fair and just way. Uh, in reality, I believe that modern laws in, in, in systems that we have outside of Islam have generally failed to do these things, broadly speaking. They fail to deter people from committing crimes, broadly speaking. Uh, it's generally the case that the punishments are getting lighter and lighter and the amount of incarceration and things like that is, mm. is increasing. Uh, people are not being deterred from committing crimes, neither as individuals nor as a society because the punishment just isn't enough to deter people from doing it. There is not appropriate retribution typically and that's why we see people committing crimes that are horrific crimes and getting 10 years in jail for which they serve five. Right, yeah. You yeah. know, that is, uh, you know, there isn't, that is not appropriate retribution. It's not appropriate that somebody takes someone's life or somebody severely harms another person. And you're talking about some of the most horrific crimes and then literally has five years of relative comfort after which they walk out free. And it said that is retribution for, you know, what they have done. I think that. You know, that is something that typically now in, in modern legal systems is a complete failure, to be honest. Uh, it doesn't incapacitate criminals typically. It doesn't provide a means to rehabilitation. And in Islam, I want to think about rehabilitation, not in the dunya, but also in the akhirah. How do I stand in front of Allah having committed this crime? How do I purify myself? And how do I come before Allah and make up for what I have done? Nor is there appropriate restitution typically for, uh, you know, for, for these kind of crimes. Mm -hmm. And then add to that, that typically we spend as, let's say, taxpayers in the West, we spend billions and billions of pounds pampering these criminals. Uh, typically a criminal in jail in the UK costs 45,000 pounds. That is, um, what is that, about $60,000 yeah, or so, something, that, something like that, yeah. Like that. Yeah. every single year. So you have people who have taken the lives of other people, sometimes children, in horrific ways, who have committed crimes that, to be honest, you can't, if it wasn't for the retribution in the hereafter, you would say there is nothing we can do to them in this dunya, whatever cry, whatever torture you can think of would not be equal to the crime that they did. And yet we now pay £45,000 a year to pamper those people mm. and look after them yeah. and take care of them when their victims are left with nothing. So... To be honest, I genuinely believe that the systems that are there in the West are not serving either the people who committed the crimes, let alone the victims, in terms of giving them a means to true rehabilitation and reconciliation and so on in terms of the hereafter as well as the worldly life. They aren't deterring people from committing crimes. They aren't providing suitable retribution. And ultimately, they are costing on top of that loads and loads of money and you just have to look at the state of prisons today and all the mental health issues, the people who are, you know, suffering in there, who, to be honest, really, you know, you see actually even just looking at the historical pattern from their system that things have got worse as they have lightened these punishments, not better. And I believe that is a, a fairly general trend. There isn't a lot if you look in the world today, which mm. where you can find exceptions to that trend typically. So I believe that's really important. I'm not going to mention yeah. too many more things. Okay. Um, sorry, carry on. No, let's get into a bit more of a discussion. I think some people who might be watching this might think that just the failure of one system, for example, the system that the West generally adopt, does not necessarily indicate that the other system is a successful one. Yeah. I, I actually agree with that as a, initially. Yeah. I agree with that as we need to investigate. Yes. But I do believe that the people that people shouldn't be throwing stones from glass houses. Mm. You know, you have people in Western systems where 
to be honest, the system is an utter and total failure in every regard. It isn't serving anybody. It's not serving the public. It's not serving the victims. It's not helping people to stop commit crimes. And then those people stand in their glass houses throwing stones and saying, your Sharia is uh, But, but those, those people also say that these are man-made laws. We're going to get there. We're taking our time. We're improving every century, mm. every decade. But your uh, laws are divine from God, from Allah. Exactly. Surely that should be more criticized and, and, that's and looked what, at. And, and that's what we're going to we're going to prove inshallah in yeah. this hot seat episode that these laws are the ones that are suitable and that it's actually this law the divine law that would actually bring about those objectives that those non-muslims have quoted being deterrence mm -hmm. both general and specific retribution rehabilitation both in this world and the hereafter and uh, restitution and inca being incapacitated and so yeah. on, that those would actually come from the religion of Islam. I would also say on the issue of our system will get better, I would say that sadly the trend is that the system is not getting better. It's actually, it's actually getting worse. And there are reasons why that system has got worse over time. And I understand that, uh, that there, and I believe there are unique features of the Islamic legal system which do not apply in the same way. So for example, and I don't want to get too much into details, so I have a few introductions, yeah. but for example, when it comes to capital punishment, people, the biggest reason people oppose capital punishment, and I'm not saying this is the only reason, but the reason that comes at the top of the surveys is miscarriage of justice. So if we can prove that Islam puts in a system that is strong enough to prevent miscarriage of justice, that argument no longer stands as being a significant reason to abolish capital punishment. And what do you mean by miscarriage of justice? Someone who is falsely accused and then falsely... And, and ends up losing their yeah, life and for then, something, they yeah, didn't for something that they didn't yeah. do. And that is the, the usually the number one in just surveys general. Just look yeah. at surveys people have said who oppose capital punishment. Usually the reason why is not an ideological reason that we shouldn't be taking people's lives. But typically it is, what if there's a miscarriage of justice? So that is something that I believe Islam provides a very strong answer to, which means that the reasoning is not the same. But if you look at the general trend, the general trend is uh, across the world is generally the lightening of punishments, the lessening of punishments, and sadly an increase in rates of crime. I mean, I my grandmother tells me or told me about uh, times when people used to leave the door open in the UK, you know, you used to leave your front door open. And now people have three, you know, bolt the door three times and the alarms and CCTV cameras and, you know, what have you. It hasn't, it hasn't improved. It's actually gotten worse, mm -hmm. despite the fact that their legal system and criminals, uh, criminal justice system is, is supposedly improving. Mm -hmm. So my argument would be your, your system is improving and your situation is getting worse. Yeah, something okay. isn't isn't quite right in that in that in that regard. So I just wanted to to, to mention a few sort of uh, a few points. I think Allah Subhanahu wa Taala's ruling. We have to understand that there is no ruling. As we're told in Islam, there is no ruling better than the ruling of Allah. Allah Azza wa Jalla said, al Is it the ruling of the pre-Islamic times that they want? Is the law, is it the law of pre-Islamic times that they want? Who is better than Allah in ruling, in law, than a people or for a people who have certainty? The Islamic system is a holistic system. You know, I think when you just focus on only the aspect of punishments, you can skew the picture. Yeah. And I do think, and I, I do think it's it's a valid topic. I'm pleased that you've decided to to raise this topic yeah. on the hot seat because it is a valid topic. But also to make that Islam is unfair on the religion of Islam. Islam needs to be seen as a whole, not as one particular uh, focusing on one particular aspect, because that does give you a misunderstanding of the religion of Islam. It doesn't give you the balance of all the things that Islam brings. Uh, Islam is a religion for all people, all places, and all times. It is a religion that works everywhere in the world. And uh, a lot of times when people criticize things, they they do tend to look with very, very narrow tunnel vision at 
um, what they believe to be their specific situation. Right. And I think it's important that people understand that Islamic law is for everyone everywhere. Including their specific including situation. Including their specific situation. And I think that that is something that people often neglect, to be honest. They, uh, they often neglect or they often, for example, if, they, if you live in a society that is relatively, shall we say, safe or yeah. relatively, um, you know, sort of um, an, a relatively advanced society in terms of what people consider to be things like criminal justice and things like that, people tend to look at that and then they tend to uh, sort of make criticisms, which to be honest, if they were to go you know, a few hundred miles in any one direction, they would see, they would be able to clearly see the wisdom behind uh, some of the things that are said. But the point I was trying to make by, by saying include in their society mm. is that you might have people who, like you said, in their society, it might not, it might not match. It might not. Mm. No, I do believe it matches. I don't okay. believe it's the case that it doesn't match. I believe it's an issue of hikmah because we believe there is no one better than Allah in, in hukum. Mm -hmm. There is no one agreed, better than agreed. Allah in, in his law. Yeah. And that that law is wise in that country. But sometimes to see the wisdom of that, you know, for example, there are people who make very, uh, you know, they climb on the ivory tower and they make very, very uh, sort of judgmental pronouncements based on a very limited set of life experiences. And, you know, for example, uh, that person ha has not been victim to some of these crimes, sure. for example. Yeah. And they make pronouncements about things that, to be honest, if they were to have a broader range of life experiences and to see life outside of the, the bubble they're in, sometimes you would say to them that actually, you know, shall we go to some of the victims of these crimes and ask them about justice? Mm -hmm. You know, you have to see that. What I mean is you have to open your eyes to the wider world. Yeah. Yeah, and that's, I believe that is, that is something okay. to be mentioned, which is important. Um, I believe it's important, and I have mentioned already just to emphasize the issue of uh, of looking at the hereafter as well as the worldly life, both in terms of saving, being saved from punishment in the hereafter, and the issue of rehabilitation in terms of the akhirah, not just in terms of the dunya, in terms of being forgiven by Allah, being entered into Jannah, um, and having your sins wiped out. That is of value, and a lot. Of, again, I saw people who criticized a lot of things uh, in the Islamic uh, legal system. And they did so from an atheist perspective that there is nothing in the hereafter. And I believe that that, is, that, is, that skews your judgment about these issues. So it's important to remember that Islam doesn't just look at the dunya. It's not just about your life here. It's also about, and we talk about people who confessed to crimes and had punishments carried out while the Prophet ﷺ discouraged them from that. Mm. And they still continue to confess. What made that person wish to confess? Mm. And it is the fact that I want rehabilitation in the hereafter. Now, that's not to say that Islam encourages that. We're going to talk about that, inshallah, in sure. more detail. But just to understand that people didn't see, you know, the people living through that, they, didn't, they weren't just looking at what's going to happen today and tomorrow and next week. They were looking at what am I going to be like when I stand in front of Allah, uh, Yawm Al-Qiyamah. I think it's really important uh, to mention uh, two or three core principles. I think, first of all, that when we talk about punishments, that punishments are the right of the sultan. They are the right of the person in authority. Islam doesn't advocate uh, vigilantism. It doesn't advocate people taking the law into their own hands. And this only creates chaos. In reality, it has to be done through the framework of authority. And uh, we can talk about that yeah, in more detail. Yeah, I'm sure we're going to come to that. And I think we will come to that. But I just wanted to establish that as a, I wanted to set that out sure, as a principle no for people who might catch the beginning of the video, yeah. perhaps, that it's really important to understand that that the issue of punishments, this is from the matters which are from the hukuk of the sultan, the right of the sultan to carry them out. And they're from the responsibility, the mas'uliya of the sultan, the one who is in authority. Okay. And that's important. And finally, this golden principle Al-hudud tudra'u bishubuhat. And this principle, I think, if, it, if Islam only came with this principle in hudud, I think that we could have solved so many problems with people's, you know, the criminal systems and criminal justice systems just with this one thing. That severe prescribed punishments are not carried out in the case where there is any doubt 
over what happened, when there is any mm. shubha over what happened. Mm. And I will give an example, and I'm sure we'll come to more examples mm. later, but let's say, for example, a person is convicted of theft and they are going to have a punishment carried out for the, uh, upon them, the prescribed punishment for theft. However, in their mind, in their eyes, they don't believe that what they did was theft. The, the court has ruled what you did was okay. theft. Okay. But he said, when I, I believe that I had a debt to this person, this person had a debt, they owed me money, there was a debt between us, and I only took what was, what was mine already. Does not open the door to, for anyone just to claim that excuse? No doubt the Sharia has to put in some rules and regulations. Now, that doesn't mean they're not punished. Okay. But the prescribed punishments, the one that you, the ones you're going to get out now and take out of your, <laughs> take out of your, you know, out of your bag and start with throwing at me now, yeah? Those prescribed yeah. punishments are not carried out when there is doubt. Let's take, for example, zina. The court rules this person committed zina, but he says, I was under the understanding that I was, I believe that this was a valid marriage. That was their understanding. Now, that doesn't mean they might not be punished, okay. but the prescribed punishments are not carried out when there is doubt. That's that high level of punishment is not carried out when there are shubuhat, there are questions over it or concerns over it. Uh, and the court has to examine those things. Yeah. So a person might be found guilty of a crime, but might not have the punishment carried out because it doesn't reach the standard of that punishment being carried out. And instead we go back to ta'zir, which is the concept we're going to talk about a lot. Ta'zir is the issue of what you would call, um, it's the issue of punishments and penalties mm. which are not prescribed specifically by Allah Azza wa Jal or by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam within the Quran and the Sunnah, but instead the judge makes a discretionary decision. We call it discretionary punishments. Okay, yeah. So for example, imprisonment for a year or a fine, and the fines are matter, the, the scholars differ sure. over it, whether fines can be discretionary punishments or not. But this issue of discretionary punishment could still be carried out. This could be said, okay, you have a fine of this and you have to go to jail for this many years. That's a discretionary punishment. But the punishments that are, the headline punishments in Islam are not carried out when there are doubts, confusion, or misunderstandings present within the within the case okay let's go into some of those uh, headline yeah. uh, headline punishments and i think there are probably two extremes that people fall into one as you've outlined in the introduction is saying that the sharia is all about these kind of punishments and nothing else and it is restricted to that and another extreme on the other end is to avoid that completely and let's not even talk about them and pretend like they don't exist you're trying to say that you're representing a middle path here that acknowledges their ex existence but within a framework a wider framework that also needs to be acknowledged i, I want to say also not just a, that i acknowledge their existence i'm proud of them yeah i became muslim one of the major things that helped me to become muslim is when i heard about the islamic punishments that existed and i honestly looked at them and felt you know what it is? I really believe this would solve the problems in our society. And I really saw the wisdom in it. And I felt this is how it should be. And it really encouraged me to look into Islam more. You know, when people say these type of things, a lot of times people step back and say, yeah. whoa, you know, like this is really uh, severe or this is really harsh. But I actually thought, you know, I can see the wisdom or I can see part of the wisdom in that and i was very very and until now i i'm thoroughly proud of of the islamic legal system and i don't make any apologies for it at all i believe that it is what will bring about uh it will bring about reconciliation and peace within the society and safety and security for everybody and within that there's some advice to the people giving da'wah whether the dua to or even just the general layman to speak into a non-Muslim colleague, for example, not to hide anything from Islam because you never know something like that might be the, the thing that actually a non-Muslim yeah. hears. And, like, oh. and also, I, I feel that's true. A lot of people do hide things and they, they kind of try to sugarcoat things. And sometimes the person later on finds out yeah. about them and then feels really betrayed. Like, I feel like, well, you know, I wanted to go in with my eyes open. And surprisingly, people, you would, you know, you would be surprised. A lot of people... The things you think that people might find difficult because you perhaps found it difficult yourself when you first heard about it to, to understand the context of it. 
um, then you might be surprised that those things might actually be what, yeah. what brings a person to Islam. Okay, this is turning into a cold seat. So let's get, let's make okay. it a bit warmer, inshallah. Let's warm up. Okay. So, All right. uh, you hear things like stoning, for example. Okay. Let's start with this particular yes. punishment. Let's start with Does this thing. exist in the Sharia? Is this a prescribed punishment that you're proud of? Yeah, absolutely. There is no doubt by the consensus of the Muslims that stoning exists within the Sharia of Islam. And stoning is something that exists within the Torah as well. Okay. And that is something that is also, to the best of my knowledge, not disputed that stoning is explicitly mentioned in the Torah. In fact, it's mentioned in the Torah for crimes like, uh, for example, a rebellious son is stoned to death. Uh, one who violates the Sabbath is stoned to death. Uh, falsely presenting a bride as a virgin mm. is stoned to death. Cursing God, stoned to death. And inviting people to other religions, also stoning to death in the Torah. That's in what we have, what they have of the Torah. We do not know if that is what Allah Azza wa Jalla sure. revealed upon them because this is the ruling of Shara'u man qablana. We don't have a proof for that one way or the other about whether that is, uh, whether that was revealed by Allah Azza wa Jalla. But I wanted to show that uh, this is something that clearly has a divine origin because it is clearly present in the previous scriptures without a shadow of a doubt. And it is something which we know in the previous scriptures was the punishment for adultery of a married person. Mm. We know that because of what happened when the two Jewish people were brought before the Prophet Sallallahu having committed zina. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he asked them, what do you find in the Torah for these people? And they said, we blacken their faces and we parade them. You know, we parade them around the city. So the Prophet asked for the Torah to be brought and to be read. And they covered Ayat al-Rajam. They covered the part that's talked about stoning to death. And when they lifted their finger, they saw that they had concealed the fact that the punishment for them was, uh, was to be stoned to death. So there's no doubt that this is something that existed before. And there is no doubt that this is something that exists within Islam. Now, I want to describe this punishment a little bit. Okay. Because I do think it's important to understand the proper way of carrying out a punishment. Because I started looking into this and uh, I started looking into different methods of execution. It's a bit, okay, so bit, bit, yeah. bit more, yeah, yeah. But I did start looking into different methods of execution, yeah. um, lethal injection, uh, electrocution, gas chambers, and all that type of stuff. And I also looked into how stoning is carried out in different countries. And I, we want to be clear that what we were talking about is Islam here. We're not yeah. talking about a particular implementation of this in, uh, in, in a particular country. So the man is buried in the ground to the waist. The woman is buried in the ground to her chest height okay. uh, for additional concealment. The stones should not be so large that they cause death. One stone causes instantaneous death, like dropping a boulder. Yeah. And that is actually, I believe what certain people took from the Torah and the Talmud is they actually, what their practice was, was to push someone off the top of a building and drop a big boulder on them. Would that not be better and quicker? Some people may argue. That's not the rule. I, I believe it is quicker, but that's not the ruling that Allah revealed. The mm. ruling that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed was in the middle. Not to use a big boulder that disfigures a person or crushes a person in one go and the person dies, nor to use little stones that prolong their punishment. And you know, there's something in Islam, well, I found it so amazing when I was reading the, the, the chapters around this and the fiqh around this, is how much the scholars of fiqh talk about not excessively hurting a person. It's surprising because we're talking about punishments, yeah. but not excessively hurting the person. They disliked and discouraged the use of very small stones that prolong a person's suffering. The purpose here is the person to suffer. Mm. And this is the purpose. But before that, the purpose is to deter people from doing this, right? Okay, yeah. So the, the purpose here is that, like Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala said and others, this person has uh, committed a crime which affected their whole body. And the person in that way, the, the threat of pain, the threat of the pain of this punishment is what will stop a person from a punishment, which, from a crime which is very easy to fall into, right? It's very desirable. It's all about desires and shahawat. And, yeah. you know, the person wants to do this and there's a very strong pull from the shaitan. But thinking about the potential punishment from that, that's a big deterrent in stopping people from doing it. And I want to also, uh, so here we said, neither should it be small stones okay. that cause uh, unnecessary suffering. 
nor should it be a, a huge boulder that is dropped upon a person, but it should be something of medium size that will get the matter over quickly, but at the same time will serve as a strong deterrent. And I'm going to show you why stoning for adultery is intended to be a deterrent before everything else and why it fulfills both deterrence and retribution properly. In terms of deterrence, for a person to be stoned to death, we said that stoning to death is carried out for adultery of a married person mm -hmm. who has had intimacy in an Islamically valid way. So as for the young child, like young kid or young, you know, like teenager or whatever, who fell into an error and made a mistake and whatever, this person is not stoned. The one who is stoned is the one who has had a valid marriage, has had intimacy as part of a valid, correct marriage, okay. and then has committed adultery. And that's consistent with the Islamic goals and aims of uh, preserving uh, honor and preserving people's religion and protecting them. So here, what does it take for someone to be convicted of adultery in Islam? Okay, yeah, good question. For someone to be convicted of adultery in Islam, in reality, there are only three ways that a person can be convicted of adultery in Islam. One is confession. And when we see from the Prophet ﷺ, he did not accept the confession immediately. Mm. When people would come, the story of Ma'iz, for example, radiallahu an, um, and the Ghamidi, and many stories of, of, of this that happened in Islam, the Prophet ﷺ discouraged them. He said, I think you just go away and think about it. You know, ask Allah's forgiveness. Go back, you know, perhaps it didn't happen. Perhaps this wasn't what happened. Would discourage the person from confessing. Sorry, you said at the start that he was not a shari'ah. He wasn't, so isn't he taking yes. the law into his own hands? I mean, Allah has prescribed so his punishment Allah and has, he's trying so to delay Allah it. Allah has revealed that the job of the hakim, and this is, my, this is exactly my point, that the purpose that Allah legislated this for has more to do with deterrence than it does to do with retribution. Okay. In the sense that the Prophet ﷺ is only mubalik, he's only doing what Allah told him to do. He doesn't speak from his own desire, it's only a revelation that is revealed. So he discouraged them. Go and make repent between you and Allah. You know, if you haven't been caught doing this, don't don't take the, the cover that Allah has covered you with, don't go out and take that cover away from people. He discouraged them several times until he sent them away. And in some of the situations, he sent them always, go, go think about it. Then when the situation persisted that they kept on confessing, no, Messenger of Allah, I want the punishment to be carried out upon me. Mm -hmm. He established that the person is, is sane, that the person is not suffering from uh, mental illness, that they are not a child, they have reached the age of adulthood, because this can only be carried out upon an adult, that there are no shubuhat, no confusion. And that's why the Prophet in some of the narrations asked, perhaps you only did this. Meaning perhaps you didn't reach the level of what is sure, Islamically sure. considered adultery. You know, perhaps you had a relationship that didn't reach that far. Perhaps you don't know what adultery actually, the level of what adultery actually is. And so on. And it's only when they persisted in confession that this punishment was carried out. That's the first way. The second way is pregnancy that could only have happened through adultery. Mm. That is the second way that adultery or fornication is established. So in this, there are very clear rules. There cannot be any shubha, any doubt. Uh, for example, the person comes and says, no, I actually had a, 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 a premature uh, birth or something like that. It wasn't like that. I was married. I, you know, all of those things stop the punishment from being carried out. Yes, the judge may go to the level of ta'zir, of discretionary punishment, if he believes it happened, but it doesn't go to the level of the punishment that we're talking about here, of stoning to death. And the third is for four adult male witnesses to witness the actual act of penetration in terms of intercourse and not for them to see only two people go in a room together right. or to hear something or to see, you know, something happening from a distance. That is a virtual impossibility that that would ever happen unless these people are out in the middle of the street. Yeah. So this is something that has, you can see from these things that really this is something where the, the, the majority of the emphasis is on 
deterrence. It's on deterrence. And this punishment of stoning is one that truly deters a person. It's one of the only things that actually deters the shahawat, the strength of the shahawat that leads a person to do this. This is one of the only things that actually genuinely deters it. But on top of that, Ibn al-Qayyim also mentioned or alluded to the fact that from the point of retribution, this person enjoyed something which affected their whole body. So they also, in terms of retribution, deserve a punishment which affects their whole body as well. So the retribution is also in line with the crime. And this is something which, let's be honest, it breaks families apart. Uh, we're not talking about unmarried people here. Yeah. We're not talking about young uh, guys and girls doing things they shouldn't and, you know, so on. Yeah, okay. We're talking about something that breaks apart families. We're talking about something that has huge effects upon, uh, you know, children, children that come out from that. We have absolutely, you know, it's, it's something that's really sad that in the world today, people just don't recognize how serious this, uh, this thing is. But the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi mentioned among the worst of the things that a person can do is to commit adultery, for example, with, uh, the, the, with the neighbor or with the, you know, the, 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 the lady who is, uh, you know, the, say, for example, the wife of the neighbor or the daughter of the neighbor, for example. Okay, let's... And what this does. So you see what I'm, what I'm now putting across to you? Yeah, I, I, I get the picture that you're trying to paint. Uh, I think it requires some further probing. And obviously, this is the first punishment that we're discussing. So there'll be some introductory questions, for example, with the uh, issue of miscarriage of justice, like you've mentioned. Mm. So we are basically, and you've obviously laid out the three types of scenarios that this could be carried out. And you're saying that this really gets rid of all shubuhat and it can't be carried out if there's any shubuhat, any doubt. Yeah. So for example, CCTV, DNA, yeah. all that stuff is not it's considered not to be, is not is not sufficient to establish this yeah. Punishment. Yeah, the, pr the problem that people have is that this is such an extreme punishment. And yes, Ibn al-Qayyim might say that the whole body experienced pleasure, but that's a temporary pleasure. And now this is a permanent ending of someone's life. Mm -hmm. That is such a strong punishment on a system that is dependent on human beings. For example, four male witnesses could conspire, could conspire, come together and conspire and say, we saw this act. This is, this is something that is open to... I, I disagree with that for, for, okay. for a reason. I think, first of all, that if there is any indication of a conspiracy, then that would surely be enough to prevent that punishment from being carried out because al-hudud tutra' bi shubuhat Hudud are not carried out in the presence of questions or confusion. So that's one thing. The second thing is, it, historically, mm. there just aren't any cases where these four witnesses actually came out and witnessed this. This is something that is so rare that it's virtually non-existent that four witnesses actually witnessed this happening, except the people who we're talking about in, you know, in full public display. Other than that, it really isn't conceivable and it hasn't really happened in history. And that's why really all of the times this has happened have really been through confession, not through Okay. Uh, what about the second witnesses? one you mentioned, like uh, a pregnancy that mm. could not have happened unless it was outside of marriage? No DNA test. Like, how does that come to pass then? And how could that not be a mis case of mistaken identity or something that's gone wrong? I mean, wrong the along fact that she's pregnant is kind of... But if she's married to someone okay. and, then she, and then she's pregnant with someone else's child, so for example... Is, that's a shubha then. Oh, so that wouldn't be, that wouldn't lead to the end punishment. We're talking about something that there is no... Uh, there you're saying a, it's only if she's not married and she becomes pregnant. That's what you're saying. And there's no conceivable way. Or for example, her husband is hasn't been in the country for two years. How do you find out the man who... who so is the punishment just on her or is it also there, the, the man? No, then that depends. If, she, if, she, if we don't have a proof for who the man was, then we can't carry out the punishment, can we? Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. And I, I think that the all of the, the, the regulations and the restrictions here show that the emphasis on this is actually deterrence. There's yeah, a I think greater emphasis agree with that. upon deterrence than there is upon, uh, and the fact the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam discouraged people from confession. If, if the purpose here was retribution, then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would not have discouraged the person who came to confess. Yeah, I think a lot of people would totally agree that it's a huge deterrent. I think people generally accept that. They're not going to argue with that. But this punishment being carried out in certain circumstances, even though those circumstances require a lot of detail behind those circumstances, the fact that it's carried out 
for a crime that many people see is not harming anyone. It's not murder. Mm -hmm. It's not rape. It's just two consenting adults. It's a very, very strong punishment for a lot of people to digest. I think this is because of the corruption in society today and the fact that we have we have lost the the we have lost a lot of our values about what's wrong. You know, what's actually wrong. Like for example, I, I mean, we're, I'm sure we're going to talk about apostasy later on, but people will also say that apostasy is a victimless crime mm. and you know that this is, you know, that this is not an issue. Yeah. I, I believe adultery absolutely destroys the fabric of society. I really believe that adultery in terms of cheating on a spouse absolutely destroys the fabric of society. And I believe if the punishment is not severe, then the encouragement and the desire overcomes the punishment. There has to be a severe punishment for this. And Islam is consistent about this, by the way. And I believe this is another issue, perhaps we should have mentioned the principles, that the consistency of the Islamic punishments, that Islam is very consistent Adultery is regularly mentioned among the most severe of crimes. It's not the case that that in Islam it's a minor sin, but oh, you get stoned right. to death for it. You right, know? I see, yeah. This is a severe crime in mm -hmm. Islam, and honestly, I believe that we've just we've reached a time in our society where there's such a breakdown of society that people no longer believe that to be something which is a major thing, and we're not talking about two young people who get into a relationship, who do something they shouldn't, that's a different matter. And the punishment for them is suited to them. And we're also not talking about the slave and so on and so forth, which has its own rulings to it. But we're talking about now someone who goes and cheats on their spouse. We're talking about the danger that brings to children, the fact that children are brought up with, with, from broken families. That has a huge impact yeah, on society. Okay. That's fair and the purpose here is that you have a crime that there is a huge desire to commit. I'm sorry, but murder, there is not a huge desire to commit murder typically. Mm. Yeah. And you have to be yeah. pretty yeah. upset, you know, and angry mm. to yeah. think about killing somebody. But zina is something which, yes, there is a desire to do it. There is a motivation to do it. The shaitan's pull for you is strong. So you need a deterrent, which is very, very strong. And ultimately, the fact, and I, and I really believe this also must be mentioned, the very fact that this punishment is known to everyone in the society makes it fair. Because if it wasn't known, if somebody just turned up on the shores one day, you know, landed on the plane, you know, got into a relationship with a married woman and then said, oh, you know, I didn't even know this was wrong. Fair enough. There you can say now we have to discuss. But this is something that is known. It yeah. is announced in Islam. Yeah. So the person now has to take in responsibility the, the, the consequences for their actions. If I go to a country and that country tells me, if you do X, Y, Z, we will do this to you. Then I have to take responsibility for my actions in this. That's my responsibility. It's mm. not unfair. It's my responsibility to now decide what I want to do and to take on board, you know, the responsibility for the actions that I've done. Yeah. So I wanted to, I want to almost flip your argument where you're saying that this is something that is the desire is so strong, which totally totally agree that many people would see that as something part that Allah has put in inside us. This this strong desire. We have a hadith that says, Kulu bani Adam qatta. Everybody, everybody falls into sins, especially a sin where the desires are as strong mm. as this. Yet for that to happen, a mistake, a one-off mistake that someone's made, they come to confess and at this- Why do they come to confess? They, they just feel guilty. Why do they come to confess? They feel guilty because they know they made a mistake. Why do between them and Allah and repent and nobody knows about it? They, ju they just feel like they can't show their face in society. It might be multiple reasons. I'm not sure. Why, in why? that case, then do, should we not look at the forgiveness? So let, let us look at the at the stoning that was done. For example, to let's look at Ma'iz, for example, in the in the hadith of Ma'iz, uh, the, the Prophet said, That he has made a repentance that if that repentance was shared among the whole ummah, it would be enough for them, or a whole group of people, it would be enough for them. In some narrations, it's mentioned regarding one of the women that she made tawbah, with the tawbah that if it was divided among 70 people, it would have been enough for them. That is a person's personal choice to make that tawbah. You're right, they get in that situation, I can't show my face to society, I feel terrible, they can't keep it between them and Allah, and then the punishment is carried out to them, they are completely forgiven for that sin in the sight of Allah Azza wa okay. More than that, the Prophet said that it's a tawbah that if it was shared among 70 people, every one of them would be forgiven for the sins they did. It's, just, it's a very strong tawbah. Yeah. It's not encouraged in Islam to do. The Prophet discouraged it. It's not encouraged in Islam. But the fact that it, 
a person may make a personal choice for that to be carried out for them, they will get the reward of that in the hereafter in for the okay. forgiveness of Allah and the rehabilitation as it relates to the rehabilitation and ukhrawi in okay. the hereafter. Perhaps confession was actually the wrong example because you're right. Okay. That, that requires, was the wrong but, but <laughs> let's talk about a woman, like you said, the husband's traveling. She's made one mistake now. She's got pregnant as a result of it. She's now going to be stoned to death as of this result from a desire that is so strong. So in obviously she's going to have the, the baby first and she's going to provide the baby with, uh, f feed the baby okay. first because there's, we, we don't punish the baby at the end of the day. And okay. she's going to, the baby has to be at a stage where it can be uh, looked after by someone and so on and so forth. Okay. And then she has knew, she knew this this punishment existed ultimately. But she's just fallen into a mistake where the desires are so strong originally. And then she'll be forgiven then for what she has done. She'll be forgiven by that. At the end of the day, the mistake mistakes are mistakes, but they have consequences. Ty, one day somebody falls into a mistake and decides to do something that is uh, an act of disbelief. Yeah. It's a mistake, but they have consequences. And you, and you say we that, have to accept the consequences of our but, actions. But there's also consequences to society, like you say, like the the concept of zina and the the thing that happens to society. This baby now has to go out without a mother, That's through no fault of his own. Absolutely, this baby has now has to be looked after. The baby is not guilty of anything. A person doesn't carry the burden of someone else, but that baby now has to be looked after and taken care of, either by by the 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 processes that are put in place by the state by the muslim treasury and so on or by a family that adopts that child and that child should not be given any should not be uh, given anything that disadvantage that makes you know a disadvantage for them at the end of the day but we still have to punish the person who is guilty of the crime otherwise there's no deterrence yeah i think a lot of people would would actually feel more comfortable if this was about if this was the punishment for example for murder and not for zina because murder like you said is not something that you really inherently want to do so if you've really gone to that extreme there's a big punishment for you but it just i think some people feel uncomfortable with the concept of two cons Consenting adults. Yeah. So I think we've, we've kind of been around this before. This idea that of, first of all, what zina, and, and we're not to, to, we're talking about two consenting adults. Let's be clear that we're talking about the ones who are married here. We're not mm. talking because the desire for them should be less. They have a permissible alternative uh, for this. They've chosen to betray their spouse. Unless the husband's traveling, like yeah. you said. Okay, but they've chosen to betray their spouse. Is that yeah? Yeah, yeah that's fair. That's fair. Yeah. And they have done something which causes a fundamental breakdown in the fabric of, of, uh, of society. Mm -hmm. And again, the number of people who've actually been punished from, for this in Islam is actually very, very small because it requires either confession, in which case that's a toba from the person and they'll be rehabilitated in the akhirah, or it requires a level of proof which really isn't... Uh, it is very unlikely to happen except in the most extreme of of cases mm. okay. i think that is a, that's a balance and i i think that this idea that you know that people mention that love is not a crime mm. i actually find that to be uh to be an emotional argument that doesn't really look at the reality of what happens and that's what people say it's, you know it's yeah. consent to uh, consenting adults and they talk, say the same thing about homosexuality and say the same thing about many other things that this is not, this should not be something that is a crime, but ultimately Allah Azza wa is the one who should decide what is allowed and what is not allowed. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has legislated this. Zina. Don't come near to zina. It's a filthy thing to do. It's an evil thing. It's an evil way to go. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has consistently told us yeah. this. And, so, and, and I suppose when you look at the Sharia in the whole, like you said, the importance of doing that, the fact that the, the free mixing is not allowed and the niqab and the jilbab and there's so many steps that prevent it to get into even this stage. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, let's look at the punishment itself. You, you described quite a gruesome picture. I'm going to have to put a disclaimer at the start of this video, I think. Uh, men being bowed to, to the waist, women being bowed to the chest. Being stones, people are, th are people throwing these stones? People are throwing stones. They're not allowed to curse the person. The Prophet pro prohibited them from cursing the person. Okay. Uh, some of the scholars said the Imam should be the first one to throw the stone or the Qadi okay. should be the first one because the Qadi is the one who made the pronouncement. Some of them said this. Not okay. Said this. Did any of the scholars say uh, like how long this might take? Like, so, uh, is it half yeah. an hour, an hour? I, I looked into this. Yeah. So I have some, uh, some uh, statistics on this in terms of methods of, of the death penalty. So... Uh, definitely beheading, 
I know it's going to be a bit gruesome, right? Yeah, so, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm yeah. sure you had an interesting evening the other night when you looked so, into it. Yeah, I mean, if anyone looks at my Google history, yeah, it's all like beheading, stoning to death, <laughs> a lethal injection. Uh, so beheading, typically, uh, if it's done uh, mercifully and properly with a sharp sword, should take around about two seconds before the okay. person loses consciousness and around about eight to ten seconds before the person is clinically is clinically dead. Okay. Uh, in terms of uh, electric shocks, Typically, the electric chair now is considered in most, it was only really only used in the, in the States and one other country, I believe. And it is in many places now considered to be cruel and unusual punishment. Uh, there have been people who have taken over half an hour uh, to die because of botched, uh, yani not having this, not having it set up properly okay. uh, and things like but that. But normal circumstances? And uh, normal circumstances, it's supposed to be quite quick, the issue of electrocution. But it's not being consistent if you look at people, the number of people who've been electrocuted and the number of times that it hasn't worked properly for one reason or another okay. is quite significant. Gas chambers take roughly somewhere in the region of 11 minutes, which is why they're not really used very uh, commonly. And lethal injection, the, again, has had a mixed result. If it's done properly, it's supposed to be relatively quick within a couple of minutes or so. Okay. But... Uh, it's not unheard of to take between 30 to 45 minutes for a person to die from a lethal injection, particularly the feeling that they may be paralyzed and in pain for that right. period of time. Right. Uh, short hanging was another one. Okay. Uh, short hanging, 10 to 20 minutes of choking to death. Mm -hmm. And long hanging is actually the closest one to beheading, which is where they measure the length of the rope. And that one should be, again, if it's done properly and measured correctly, it should be instantaneous. Okay. Um, in terms of stoning to death, I couldn't find a specific amount of time. However, it takes a very long time if the stones are very small mm -hmm. and it is relatively instantaneous if the stone is huge. Really? Um, oh, if it's, if it's huge. So, okay, yeah, yeah. Um, but the it causes instant unconsciousness. Yeah. So a one that doesn't cause instant unconsciousness, it shouldn't be, and the ulama of fiqh mentioned this, it shouldn't be a prolonged suffering. Okay. That's not the purpose of it. It should be something which is not prolonged. I have seen reports of it taking several minutes, but those reports were, as far as we can see, in countries where it is not properly, it's not properly regulated. And it wasn't, for example, people throwing like small stones and things like that. Uh, so it shouldn't be something, and this is something in all of the punishments that the scholars mention, that the purpose of the punishment is to punish. It's a punishment. Yeah but it's not to cause unnecessary uh, suffering beyond the punishment that is described in the Quran. And it's not to cause someone to be, you know, punished for this uh, huge uh, length of time. Yeah. So just like you want to look at the hudud within the context of the Sharia, this particular punishment, the context of the time, 7th century Arabia, no electrocution, obviously, at that time. Why can't we update these punishment punishments mm -hmm. to make it quicker? Like you said, Islam and the Sharia is a mercy to mankind. The Prophet but there were, there were punishments that were uh, quicker. Beheading mm. is the quickest one of all of them. Yeah. I mean, beheading is the quickest and the most merciful of all of the punishments. Two seconds for unconsciousness. Uh, with a sharp sword and the person is immobilized and a single blow, you're talking about two seconds. It's the quickest of all of them. It's quicker than lethal injection. It's quicker than electrocution. It's quicker than everything. Uh, However, the Sharia specifically legislated this punishment, even though beheading was available to them. Yes, electrocution wasn't available to them, lethal injection wasn't available to them, but beheading was available to them. And, the, and that was not chosen in this instance. And that appears to be for the reasons that I presented. And Allah yeah. knows best. Yeah, sure. I don't have a, a nus to bring to you that that is the specific reason, but you do have to ask why it is that this punishment is carried out in that way with the availability yeah. of a punishment. It's a valid point. Which is much quicker. Yeah. And there has to be a hikmah and a reason for that. Okay. Are people watching this? Other people, like from society? Yeah. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded for there to be witnesses to this punishment. And the purpose of the witnesses uh, is, there are multiple purposes behind having witnesses. The first is that the deterrence spreads among the society. Mm. Yeah, that's the first one. Okay. That people, when it's witnessed, when it's not witnessed, 
there's no deterrence in it. Yeah. You know, and yeah. ultimately a huge amount of what that person is going through is for the is in order to deter other people from doing the same. The whole point is if one person goes through this, the hope is that a hundred other people won't. You know, those other hundred other yeah, people who yeah, are on yeah, the edge yeah. of that will not go through that now. Yeah. But, but that has to be witnessed, that has to be known. That's the first thing. The second thing is to make sure that the punishment is actually carried out to ensure that this is being carried out and to witness that this is being carried out properly. And the third thing is that this is a matter of the religion and it's a matter of establishing something which is from the uh, symbolic acts within the religion, from the things which the religion is known by, that the, the, the religion has punishments that are carried out. And so the witness of them is not a, it's not a bad thing. It's not something uh, which is considered to be done on the side behind closed doors. Rather, it's something that is a part of our religion and it's a toll for that person. Ultimately, that person will be uh, washed and shrouded and buried and prayed over as would any other Muslim that died. It doesn't take them out of Islam. In fact, it's what brings them uh, forgiveness and rehabilitation in the hereafter. So uh, in the hereafter, just for from an Islamic perspective, then the person who doesn't confess but who's caught of this crime, that process of stoning actually uh, expiates their, their entire sin. Absolutely, their sins okay. expiated completely. The Prophet said, Look at Tawbah, Tawbah, ten. They've made a Tawbah that if it was divided among Ummah, among an Ummah, it would be enough for them. Or if it was divided among 70 people, it would be enough for them. As for the one who dies without that, then that person is in the or under the Mashia of Allah. If Allah wills, he will forgive them. And if Allah wills, he will punish them. And if they have made true repentance in their life, which is true tawbah and nasuha, they will be forgiven because yeah. Allah, man taba tab Allahu alayhi. Whoever makes true tawbah, Allah will accept their tawbah. And that's why in Islam, it is preferred for the one who is not caught, mm. it is preferred for them not to confess. Yeah. But it's preferred for them to keep their uh, repentance between them and Allah. But if they choose to confess, then that is something which is made available to them. And it will, inshallah, have a huge effect on them in the hereafter in terms of forgiveness and a huge effect on deterrence for the other people. And that's really the essence of the issue of haya, of, of life in qisas, in, in retribution, is this idea that when one person undergoes this punishment, mm -hmm. there are hundreds or thousands of people who otherwise would be on the verge yeah. of this who step back and say, no, you know what it is? we've now learned our lesson yeah. from that. Yeah. And that is again from the, the person with that confession and so on, which is not encouraged in the first place in Islam. I think all of these checks and balances come together to make a very balanced uh, system which genuinely achieves the goals of deterrence and retribution. Okay. No. Um, last question on this issue of uh, um, adultery then, just before we move on to some of the other punishments or some of the other crimes. Um, someone might say that appreciated that in Islam or Islamic history that this hasn't been carried out very often. But as you said at the start, this is meant for all times, all places. And if mm -hmm. this was implemented in the West, for example, on an hourly basis, you'd be getting these kind of punishments. I actually think if this was implemented in the West, you might have that the first day it was implemented. And after that, <laughs> you probably wouldn't have it at all because people would actually say no. And you know what it is? Marriage is not difficult. Well, a marriage is not difficult. Even if you're not happy with the person you're married to, both men and women have a recourse to leave the marriage. Yeah. They have talaq, khula, fasq, a way of getting out of the marriage. All Islam asks you to do is to, if you're not happy in the marriage you're in, dissolve that marriage through one of the permitted means, wait your appropriate length of time that you're required to wait, if you have a length of time you're required to wait, and then marry the person that you want to marry. Yeah. Islam doesn't make marriage difficult. You know, I think a lot of this as well, maybe it comes from the uh, certainly Catholic and other Christian sort of practices where divorce is impossible, where people typically commit adultery because mm. they cannot physically get divorced or get remarried. Islam did not make it difficult to divorce or difficult to remarry. So it's really, there is really no excuse for that level of betrayal and that level of damage to the fabric of the society and the children and the wider family and the loss of the nesab, the, 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 the loss of lineage and the loss of people's honor. Mm. There really is no excuse for that when Islam made marriage so easy. Yeah. So people will see, okay, it's easy for them to get married, 
it's easy for people to get out of a marriage that they are unhappy in. And that should be sufficient for a person without needing to go into uh, into the haram. And I also believe there's one further point that's really important about, and I, I think this is a benefit is in all of the topics, yeah. which is that it's so important that you don't spread the uh, the practice to others. It's not just that one person. So you might say, okay, let's just take the argument that it's, you know, two people in love and, you know, love is not a crime and all that type of thing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That is fine in, in one person. But what happens when that becomes a culture? Mm. Look now in the West. Hasn't it become now a it culture? Has, yeah. Everybody cheats on everyone. And it's become like cheating is normal and, and all these kids being grown up without proper, you know, uh, stable parenting and all these kind of problems that brings out in the society. And really it's become, it's become a sp something that spreads among people. So one of the purposes of the hudud is also to stop this spread of, and this is something we'll talk about inshallah when we come to apostasy as well, this issue of spreading this problem to large numbers of people in the society versus it being something that rarity that somebody falls into. Right. Okay, um, on the issue of stoning then, just before we move on, is there any other crimes in Islam where stoning is the prescribed punishment other than adultery? Uh, this is something which the uh, which there is a difference of opinion about. Um, for example, the issue of homosexuality. Homosexuality is forbidden in Islam. It's considered to be a subset of adultery in reality. Yeah. So as a subset of adultery, because you can't be legally married, you can't marry uh, someone of the same gender Islamically legally Islamically yeah. You can't marry someone Of the same gender So that's consistent yeah. Again you know I think sometimes When Islam gets um, You know a hard time Over this kind of thing It's actually quite unfair Because to be honest Islamic rules Are, are very very consistent um, Some of the scholars Considered it to be A separate punishment A separate category That it has its own uh, Its own system of punishment and others considered it to be a subset of adultery. And as a subset of adultery, it comes under the, uh, you know, the same ruling. Um, other than that, uh, I don't recall of something at the moment. I mean, I might, okay. if you have something, you can no, 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 bring it, inshallah. I do think we should talk, though, about what about the people who are unmarried? What yeah, about unmarried what, what, what is their punishment? So the punishment for them is considerably lighter. The punishment for them is 100 lashes and to be... Uh, what they call taghrib to be uh, expelled from their from their uh, place of living right. for a year. Some of the scholars said that in terms of expelling someone to a different city, that imprisonment that that's effectively imprisonment, huh. um, or that that is equal to imprisonment. But the hundred lashes. I want to also describe how the lashes. I, I'm sorry. I want to. <laughs> yeah. I really want to describe okay. how the lashes take place. Okay. So the first thing is that the lashing should not be strong enough to cause severe damage it should not be weak enough that it doesn't hurt. It shouldn't cause any bro broken bones and it shouldn't cause any blood to pour out from the person. And the health and the age of the person being lashed should be taken into account. So an old person who's infirm, who's very weak, uh, shouldn't, especially if they believe that the lashing is going to cause them severe health issues after that, it, it can't be done. It has to go to a different kind of punishment. So again, I personally find this idea of lashing that, you know, you have these ideas of this person, you know, sort of bare back just being lashed until mm -hmm. their back is just a, a mess of blood. And, or, you know, that's not what Islam said. The lashing is meant to hurt. It's not meant to be, you know, it's meant to be painful, but it's not meant to, uh, it's not meant to cause lasting injury to a person. So how do you reconcile that with images people have seen from countries implementing this and they do see images like that? Absolutely. I think that is down to the to people not implementing the religion of Islam properly. I don't know whether those are Muslim countries or non-Muslim countries. If they're Muslim countries, then a person needs to look at how that is carried out because this is from what I looked into the statements of the fuqaha when they talked about this, the scholars of fiqh. They said that it should be strong enough that it is a deterrent and it does hurt, but it not should should not be so strong that it causes broken bones and uh, severe bleeding and things like that. It should not uh, be something that causes long term health problems for the person. And you know, honestly, well, honestly, I'm going to say something, and you might be surprised. Go ahead. But honestly, if you offered me the choice between imprisonment in a prison in the West today and lashes, 
والله اني لا اقسم بالله I would rather be lashed. When it depend on the time, the length of time you're going to be imprisoned. والله to be honest I can't think of a situation I mean okay if they said just a day <laughs> yeah you know you described it earlier as relative comfort you, you know said, you know five years relative comfort when you're talking about yeah, the five years relative comfort uh, five years in a in a in a prison I would rather be lashed to be honest it's painful it's not a nice thing to happen but it is a fitting punishment for these kind of uh, of things at the end of the day this is two people who've had a relationship outside of marriage but they haven't been married before they didn't have a halal outlet for it right uh they fell into a mistake yeah and so a hundred lashes is a very uh fitting balanced punishment knowing that when you put people in jail there's a lot of criminality develops in jail mm. yeah when you're putting people unnecessarily in jail mm. because they don't have anything else to do with them and they're just networking with other criminals yeah they actually i actually know a lot it's really sad and i, I really believe this that i i know of brothers who ended up going to prison good kids you know who to be honest they made mistakes and they went to prison and they ended up coming out as criminals yeah. you know and ultimately we have to have an alternative for that kind of yeah. system it's not the the system is not just to incarcerate everybody just keep locking people up lashes are painful they give a deterrent but they don't cause long term health uh issues for people it's something nobody wants to be lashed 100 times of course yeah. people are going to read i do not want that i would never want that to happen to me but ultimately i think that sometimes uh there are people in prison who say that death would be preferable to me i mm. mean there are quotes from inmates who yeah. say i would rather die than be in this place and i think that that the answer of just imprisoning people constantly is uh something that is actually uh in a way more harmful to those people and less beneficial to society sometimes than an issue of lashes which is obviously also a uh, uh, a punishment for uh for example substance abuse alcohol and so on and it can also be used as a ta'zir as a discretionary punishment okay. sort of something which is available to the judge to carry out should there be a crime that doesn't reach this level so i think it, it's actually something i i really don't see what the what the fuss is about to be honest about it except for when it's miss when it's it, it it's it's done inappropriately or, or sure. it's not carried out as it should be it's actually something which the person can move on with their life after having that done and they can actually go on but it's a deterrent that makes them think okay i have suffered for what i've done it, it wasn't nice to have done to me I don't want to ever do it again. It does stop other people from wanting to do it again, but I don't have to pay 45,000 pound a year yeah. to, to put this person <laughs> per person uh, yeah. per person in prison. Yeah. Okay. Um let's move on to the another quite commonly quoted issue okay. in this topic and that is the issue of chopping people's hands off for okay. for theft. Right. Chopping off the hand, huh? So first of all, I I again, I I was really uh, impressed with this uh punishment when i first heard about it when i was first uh looking into islam okay um i think that there have to be two things present for this to be a just and fitting punishment the first thing is it can't apply to all theft because there is opportunistic theft you know someone's mobile phone on the table and he just picks it up and runs off it's impulsive right yeah it's not uh what we want to see that that somebody who does an imp- impulsive theft has a, a lifelong uh disfigurement for yeah. that yeah it has to be of something of uh so it, there has to be certain conditions in in the way the theft is carried out i'm going to talk about those in islam but okay. i mean i'm just talking about from a logical fine, from fine. an actual okay, point yeah. of view yeah. that i felt that there has it can't be every theft and the second thing is that there can't be any doubt over it because it would be horrific for somebody to lose Uh, their hand yeah which is so essential to their life for them to lose their hand because of something which they were not you know they were not clear that this was uh, theft or there was a doubt over it islam provides both of those two things as we said al hudud tudra'u bi shubuhat if there are any doubts over the validity of what happened if there's any doubts in the mind of the criminal then this is something that is not carried out and i want to talk to you a little bit about some of the conditions of uh this punishment to be carried out so the first condition is that it must be stolen uh what in which the scholars they call khifyatan uh, yani ala wajh al khifya it has to be done 
secretly. Mm. Yeah, and this is there are different punishments for, for example, highway robbery where someone Fine, comes in. Okay, yeah. There are different punishments for someone swiping a phone off a desk or pulling a card out of someone's hand and running off or pulling a handbag right. and just running off. I mean, there are different things on that. Uh, it has to be wealth that is of that is considered to be valuable. That is considered to be valuable. It has to reach a certain monetary monetary value. Okay. Uh, the monetary value is uh, a quarter of a dinar, which uh, or the equivalent currency value. So it has to have a a particular value. Now, some people mention in this, what about the hadith about the one who steals an egg? Fatuqta'u mm. yadu. So they are, they lose their hand for it. The meaning is not that they lose their hand for stealing an egg, but the meaning is that they, their theft. Petty theft leads them to serious crime okay. and ultimately leads to this to be carried out. Uh, it's a condition that it should be taken from its hills, from its from a place of security. Um, so it's a premeditated theft that is taken from a place of security, okay. not just you know like oh I, I left my laptop on the table in the coffee shop and I came back and it's not there anymore. Sure. And it's somewhere, for example, it's in a safe at home. Or it's in its proper place. It's it's in the cupboard. It's put away. It has to be a theft that is uh, that is taken from a place of, you know, its proper place. It's proper where it belongs. Not something that was left accidentally sure, somewhere sure. and taken again. And it has to be proven uh, beyond uh, any doubt. If there are any doubt, then the judge, yes, the judge can apply discretionary punishment but the chopping of the hand cannot be done when there is a doubt or a shubha around it. And finally, it has to be the case that the one who was stolen from mm. actually reports the crime and wants this wants there to be a retribution for this crime and not the case that they say, okay. They can know, choose to forgive. Let it, let it go. And they can say, I, I, I don't, I don't, they can say that I don't want this, okay. this wealth, this wealth, I'm not worried. It was taken from me and I'm not, Okay. I'm not bothered about it. That's one thing. And also, if there are mitigating factors, mitigating circumstances, they call it in legal terminology, something like, for example, there is a famine, there is yeah. a problem, and people are desperate for food and somebody, you know, stole something like that, then this, again, is not a state of the, the had is not carried out here, as in the prescribed punishment. There may be ta'zir, there may be discretionary punishments, minor punishments, but the major punishments are not carried out. Mm. So really, we're talking mm. about serious, premeditated, deliberate theft. And again, this is something, you know, now I actually want just to reflect upon what's happening in a lot of countries now where theft is not being investigated. Mm -hmm. It's not being taken seriously. And it's got to the point, even in the UK, right, you know, time making this video, where burglaries of people break into people's houses, stealing their life possessions, um, you know, leaving them feeling, you know, to be honest, violated. I mean, someone's come into your house yeah, and broken into your house and, and stolen things. And it's got to the point where in many cases, the police say, well, you know, just fill in the insurance form, you know, like that's all we can do for you. And there needs to be a deterrence. There's just no deterrent for this. In current legal systems, people yeah. are just stealing with impunity. And this is a premeditated, deliberate, uh, theft of us of serious things of you know significant value, and I think that needs to have a deterrence. And I think losing your hand is a pretty fitting deterrent for that. It's very appropriate because the person is losing exactly what they yeah, used to steal to, with, you especially know? with those conditions. And I think that's something that's coming through in this discussion that all of these issues they have a number of conditions that many people might not be aware of. It's a nuanced discussion. It's not just like I saw him do it chop of his hand. Uh, you've lived in Muslim countries before, a couple of different Muslim countries, regardless of whether they're implementing this correctly or not. Have you seen uh, the issue of theft, for example, like you said, in the UK, so common, so like downplayed. Is it different in the Muslim countries? Yeah, I think it is different. And I think the more the countries implement this, the less you have in the way of, uh, of, in the way of theft. Because theft, really the motivation for theft, typically is greed, right? Usually, there are cases like mitigating circumstances where it's extreme poverty and things like that. But those would not be typically situations where you would look at the the person to to be to, to lose their hand. Yeah. You're talking about theft, which is primarily motivated by greed, and it really is. Uh, 
it, to see this, you know societies where this is clamped down on. To be honest, I I really felt very strongly about. I actually felt more strongly about this when I was looking into it than I did about, for example, punishments for adultery and apostasy. I recognize the wisdom in all of those. Those are from Allah, and Allah's ruling is the best of rulings. Yeah. But I really felt this one was one that really resonated with me because it's a really horrible thing to have something stolen from you like that in a premeditated, deliberate way. And I think that it, it needs a deterrent. Yeah. And the purpose, Islam does not want people walking around on the street without hands. That's not the purpose of the, of the rule, but you have to have something that genuinely stops people from stealing. And right now you have a, such a breakdown of the law that people, burglaries are not even being investigated. Mm. People are committing crimes all over. People are coming in, in gangs just to, you know, to steal things. And they know that there's no real consequences to what they're going to do. And I think that these, the, the whole thing here is that the greater emphasis in Islam is deterrence yeah. over uh, over retribution. Although retribution is also fair. Again, if you've stolen something and you've taken it from someone in that private place and you've, in, in a premeditated way, you've broken in and you've taken it out of its private place and it's a mat, something of value and you've really you know, caused that hurt to the person, what's a fitting retribution? Mm. What should you lose? And yeah. should you lose your tongue? And you should lose, <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, but you know, you should lose your hand. That's yeah. a fitting retribution for that. And again, we come back to this golden rule. Yeah. That this is applied more in theft than probably in anything. Because there are shubahat about it. I thought it was mine. Uh, I didn't, I thought this person owed it to me. I had an agreement with them. Sure. Like, sure, there are sure. a lot of shubahat around uh, around theft. So those yeah. shubahat don't cause this to be carried out. I think just to go back to the discussion on the, the difference between some of the Western countries and Muslim countries, I think it's often the case that, I, certainly for myself, I can only speak from my personal experience. When I was living in the UK, I generally felt like it was like this uh, all over the world. I didn't realize yeah. it was any different. And then you hear stories of Muslim countries and you mentioned that when we were talking about in the int introduction that the, the punishment system in the West and how it's failed. And one of the proofs for that is that people actually used to leave their front doors open, for example. Even in 2021, I know of stories of people in Muslim countries leaving jewelry shops with gold, just open, go for the prayer, come back, the doors open and because of this deterrent and it just, it just wouldn't happen. Um, and I think that's something that many people living in the West, they don't realize and they haven't, they haven't heard these kind of stories. Mm. Um, and I think it's profound when you think, if you think about that and you think about, you know, with so much emphasis on looking after these criminals, you know, like yeah. well, it's so unfair what we do to these poor, you know, robbers and thieves and it's so unfair what we do to them. But if you look at what one person goes through that, and the effect on the whole city is nobody steals anything. Mm. And the whole city undergoes safety and security. Yeah. The person who went through that, did they commit a crime or not? They, did, they yeah. committed a crime yeah. and they fulfilled the rules of committing the crime. So to be honest, I'm not going to you know, shed tears over that. Yeah. I'm actually going to look at the overall picture and say, well, honestly, this person also was forgiven, by the way, okay. for, their, okay. for the theft that they committed. You know, you know the issue of forgiveness, sorry. Is it, what if the person doesn't regret what they did? And they still, is it, is that, are they still forgiven? Are they, well, that's a good question. Uh, if a person doesn't regret what they did, but the punishment is carried out, yeah. perhaps we could say, and Allah Azza wa knows best, it's something to worth, worth looking into and maybe dealing with the Q&A sure. questions and answers. But there are two aspects to it. The actual sin itself, yes. Also, you mentioned that one of the conditions, and I think this will be on the minds of a lot of people, um, you said that it has to be a, of a certain amount, quarter mm -hmm. of dinar, I think you said. Yes. Any idea of the rough conversion to nowadays? It's about 1.4 grams of gold, I believe. Okay. Uh, so it is, I mean, at gold price today, it's something in the region of $85, $90, something like that. Okay. And it's something of, of significant value. Yani. We're not talking about, yeah. we're not talking about, okay. I mean, yeah. yeah. A, <laughs> I don't know. You obviously have a high expectations of you know, value. And I stuff. don't know. I That's mean, enough to really hurt someone. Like if you look at the whole world, if you look at the whole world, and we're not just talking about like, you know, salaries that people yeah, get, let's say, sure. for example, in the UAE or in the UK or something like that. But if you look at the world, that is, that's a significant amount of, of money across the whole spectrum. Because you can't have one price for one and one price for another. Of course, of course. That's, of course. A, that's not a small amount of, of, uh, of money. Even now, like, for example, if someone stole from you 20 pounds or something like that, or let's say, you know, $30 yeah. or whatever, it's not hugely, a huge amount that it's, it's you know, incredibly... Uh, painful for you or that you never get over it or mm. never be able to replace it. But I think that once you get up to a, 
significant amount like that, it does for people depending on their income, it does make a big difference to people. Do you reckon it justifies that a hand being lost for the rest of the person's life? It justifies, that level? yeah. It justifies the person losing the hand. But the point of this is not to put a value. It's not that your hand is worth $100. But the point of this is to say that small amounts that are insignificant are definitely sure. not uh, suitable for that. Like someone steals, let's say, for example, a bag of sugar or someone yeah. steals an egg or someone steals, you know, that is something that it, it shouldn't, a person shouldn't have such a severe punishment carried out upon them uh, until it reaches a level where you can say they stole something of significant value. Yeah. Okay. And what happens to people who engage in theft, but it doesn't reach those conditions? For example, they steal something smaller than that. So then it comes to ta'zir, isn't it? Discretionary punishment. So discretionary punishment is a wide topic. The scholars differed over some aspects of it. Like, is it allowed for there to be a financial punishment? The jumhur of the ulama, the, the jamahir from the, from the former dahib, they said it's not allowed to be financial. Uh, they said that financial uh, punishments are not part of ta'zir. But some of the scholars like Sheikh Islam and Taymiyyah and others, they allowed financial discretionary punishments okay. like a fine or um, from the discretionary punishments is imprisonment. Okay. From the discretionary punishments. And by the way, imprisonment in the time of the Prophet says, you know, you should be in the masjid, right? Really? Like they used to imprison someone. And he, they had, that was one of the and he, the options they had available to them to tie them to a pillar in the masjid. Yeah. That's a beautiful way yeah. of bringing a person back to the... <laughs> and giving a da'wah. Back and to the, the deen. Yeah. 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 Uh, and also the likes of lashes, but less than... And some of the, many of the scholars, they put a limit. They said it can't reach the had, it can't reach the... The same as a had, yani, like 50 or 100. It has to be a small, it has to be a number that is less than that. Okay. Some of them put this condition. So a discretionary punishment, the judge has to look at the situation and what is needed to bring about deterrence, uh, rehabilitation, uh, retribution, uh, incapacitation, and so on, uh, in context of what happened. So that's that's why you have these dis this discretionary level, which... Again, the scholars differed. Is that discretionary punishment allowed to reach such a severe level as a had? Hmm. Or must it be within sure. smaller punishments? Okay. That's a matter which the scholars differed over. And some of them allowed severe discretionary punishments. And some of them, they only allowed discretionary punishments in those things which are not, uh, which have not reached, you know, we're not, not as severe as what we've been talking okay. about. Okay, well, you've, you've talked a lot about deterrence. We've talked about retribution, rehabilitation. So we've covered two punishments so far, stoning to death, rehabilitation in the dunya, non-existent. Absolutely, 100%. Okay. Capital punishment, there is no rehabilitation in the dunya. But we did establish, by the way, when we said this in the beginning, that rehabilitation is not a universal uh, objective of, of, of sentencing. It's, it's present in some things and not others. That's why you have whole life tariffs in, in jail. There's no rehabilitation. We're not looking to rehabilitate this person at all. Mm. Um, however, rehabilitation in Islam is wider than just, I mean, how do you bring a person back to righteousness, right? Yeah. How do you bring a person back to being a, a, an upstanding member of society? That's, that's iman. That mm. rehabilitation is rehabilitation. And that's when the Sharia is a wide, yeah, uh, comprehensive Which is thing, imaniya. Yeah. It's yeah. not at the end of the day, you know, giving them a job and you know, teaching them that you don't have to steal from people and you can actually, you know, you can actually do X, Y, Z. That's a very small part of rehabilitation. And what a greater part of rehabilitation is actually Iman. Mm. And if Allah forgives a person by punishments being carried out, then that is a huge rehabilitation in terms of their Iman. There are some things for which we do not want to rehabilitate people. And that's you know clear in Islam. Yeah. For example, the person who took someone else's life. You, we, we're not looking to bring that person back into society as an upstanding member of society. You know, if you made that decision to do that and you fulfill the conditions of that, then ultimately you have to lose your own life in return for that. And that is where the retribution takes precedence because they say retribution always exists in, in sentencing okay. as opposed to rehabilitation, which is a secondary okay. factor of sentencing, not a primary factor, yeah. according to... You know, because we're talking about this from the angle of the non-Muslims who have issues yeah. with Islam. Yeah. So in their own system, rehabilitation is a secondary level consideration. It's not primary level. It's not It's not always there in every situation. Yeah. And it's often the criticism of, of their own system. When they talk about rehabilitation, a lot of people say that actually, if you've got a criminal record to come out, it's impossible to find a job. And a lot of these people then 
turn back to crime. Aren't you doing the same thing with chopping someone's hand yeah. off? They're going to come back and everyone's going to know they can't trust this guy. But one of the most beautiful things is you talked about a criminal record. So let's talk about a criminal record in Islam, okay. right? The criminal record in Islam is what the angel on your left-hand side writes down, yeah? Yeah. That's your criminal record in Islam. For that to be wiped out, people in the society recognize that this is a person who has been rehabilitated. Mm. The Prophet forbade them to be cursed, forbade them mm. to be uh, mistreated because this is a person who Allah has rehabilitated them. Wow. Allah has brought this person from the point of view of their iman, from the point of view of their practicing. And yes, it is a huge stigma for a person, but there has to be that deterrence. Because if it isn't there, that person is going to walk out tomorrow and they're going to see something someone has and covet and think, you know, I could, I could go for that just one time. But that is a, you know, a constant reminder. And ultimately, there has to be a balance. And that's why if you only look at rehabilitation as a sole goal of, of, of legislation, yeah. you actually find that you'll never find a balance. There has to be a balance. There has to be times where we say, no, retribution here is more important than rehabilitation, but we provide a means for rehabilitation. I think Islam provides the greatest means because it provides a means that relates to the person's iman rather than to the person's you know, job prospects or whatever. That is something which is a risk is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's something which is, I and mean, there's no reason why the Muslim treasury doesn't support a person in that regard. Because okay. a person is considered to be clean, you know, they've been purified. But it has to be, we have to take all of those things into account. And I would argue that no human being is actually able to get that balance right. There is no human being is able to balance between the different needs of sentencing Instead, that has to come from al alim al-Hakim, from the one who knows everything and has infinite wisdom and the best judgment. That's the only, he's the only one who can find the balance which is truly appropriate for the society. Otherwise, we keep trying to find it. And, you know, on one side, we're shedding tears over hardened criminals. And on the other side, we're just, you know, imprisoning people who are turning into criminals. And then we've got people who've committed crimes that will lie. They are like you couldn't find a punishment suitable for it and it's all just so then why down. did islam leave the the door open to tazir discretionary punishment up to a human being the qadi the judge mm. yeah i think because in discretionary punishments here the matter is lighter because it hasn't reached a level of the more severe level of the crime it hasn't reached that level and so the discretionary punishment that is available to the judge the judge has guidelines now mm. because the purpose here is now achievable within the law, framework of the law sent down by Allah. Now, it's not that the judge doesn't just sit there and pick a punishment like, well, what have we got today? We haven't, well, we haven't lashed anyone for a few right, hours. Right, right. All right, yeah, go on, let's lash them. You know, like, it's not like that. The, the judge the has fra a framework and guidelines in which to act. But at the end of the day, they are looking at these things. They are looking at how do we deter people from doing it? How do we rehabilitate this person? Because th this discretionary punishment typically, not always, but typically, is there is rehabilitation after it, typically. There are some cases that scholars differed about whether a person can be killed in discretionary punishment or not, and so on. Uh, and the judge has more, uh, it, it's something which hasn't reached that high level of severity or commonality that's so common and so normal in society, mm -hmm. like these things which Allah Azawajal has given us prescribed and specific punishments for. Allah doesn't burden a person with what they can't bear. So it must be within the ability of the judge to to give out these discretionary punishments under okay. the concept of ijtihad and so on. Okay, let's move on to something that, uh, which I would hope everybody agrees with this is a crime and it deserves to be punished, which is the issue of murder, which no doubt probably featured in your search history the, the other night. Yeah. <laughs> what is the uh, punishment in Islam for murder? Okay, so typically uh, in terms of uh, murder in Islam, the, the concept that we have in Islam is the concept of qisas. Okay, which is a life for a life. And that is something which is well established in, again, in the Torah. Just before we go into some of those things, doesn't that sound a bit mafia-ish? Like you killed one of ours, we're going to kill one of yours. And then you see this in gang culture, just constant mm. killing back and forth. Yeah, I think if you are talking about vigilantism, mm. then I think that's a valid point. But I think when you're talking about a legal system, it's not because here it's carried, this is a punishment which is revealed by Allah, which is carried out by the state, not by yeah. the, 
not by the other person. Now, that could be said, and some people do misunderstand that in the ayah in Surah Al-Isra, in which Allah Azawajal said, وَلَا تَقَتُلُوا النَّفْسَ الَّتِي حَرَّمَ اللَّهُ إِلَّا بِالْحَقِّ وَمَنْ قُتِلَ مَظْلُومًا فَقَدْ جَعَلْنَا لِوَلِيِّهِ سُلْطَانًا فَلَا يُسْرِفْ فِي الْقَاتِلِ إِنَّهُ كَانَ مَنْصُورًا That do not kill the soul that Allah has prohibited except with right. I, for example, the, the, the person who committed adultery, who, mm-hmm. you know, who is married, and so we've, so discussed, yeah. we've discussed. And whoever is killed in oppression, we have certainly given for his wali, yani his uh, close relative, we have given them a sultan, we've mm-hmm. given them authority. فَلَا يُسْرِفْ فِي الْقَتَلِ So don't let that person exceed in the killing by killing more than the person who who killed. Yani. Like as in retribution and vigilantism and so on. This person will certainly be aided. This doesn't mean that the sultan that, that is given here, that the wali of the person who is killed, just takes his sword out and goes and finds the killer and kills them. This is actually the law of either carrying the punishment or forgiving the punishment. Because we know that the wali of the person who is killed is given uh, a choice of three things okay. in a case of murder. Now, bear in mind, Islam distinguishes between murder and what is typically called manslaughter okay. or what in America they call first degree murder and second degree murder and, and so on. Like uh, accidental murder. Yeah, murder that where it's not. Uh, and Islam actually puts very stringent description and rules as to what constitutes murder for which a person can lose their life and what constitutes uh, you know, what would sometimes call second degree murder or uh, accidental killing or manslaughter, where a person has taken actions which resulted in the loss of life of a person, but it doesn't reach the level of murder. Okay. So in the second degree one, where it doesn't reach the level of murder, then the punishment is blood money. And it is that blood money is, is taken and the person doesn't lose their life uh, for that. There are actually three degrees of, of killing in Islam. There is accidental killing. There is um, probably what I would term mansl- a good word for it is manslaughter or um, sort of uh, something which sits between murder and, and accidental killing. It's not completely accidental, nor is it, nor does it match the standards of murder. Okay. And that one, there is, there is a, a higher amount of blood money in it. The one for which a person loses their life is what we would typically call first degree murder or um, the or sort of the deliberate and uh, sort of conscious uh, you know, killing of the person. Yeah. So, that is the one where the person, now the, the, the wali has three choices, right? Okay. The first choice is to demand a life for a life, which is not the life of anyone, by the way. It's not life of your yeah. gang member or okay. your tribe, yeah. the life the of the person idea. who killed. Yeah. Or for... And in terms of how that life is taken, there are two opinions among the scholars. One is that it is simply taken by the sword and it's beheading. Which the proves other, what you were saying earlier yeah. that that existed at the time. The other is that it's taken by mumathala. In other words, that what they did to kill the haram. other person is done to them unless it would be haram. So obviously there are things that are outright prohibited that could not be, it would, it would never be Islamically allowed sure. to do. Those cannot be done by mumathal, as in it was, you did it to them, we do it yeah. to you. Okay. Um, but for example, if they, let's say, for example, shot the person, then they would be shot. If okay. they stabbed the person, then they would be stabbed. If they, uh, you know, beheaded the person, they would be beheaded and so on. That's one opinion. And one opinion is that they are uh, simply killed by the, by the sword. Now, the second choice they have is to take blood money. Even for mon- yeah. even for murder. So this murder, is the, murder, this murder. is the family because ultimately that person who died, that, yeah. that person who died, has passed on. Yeah, their matter now is with Allah for Allah to reward them and for Allah to replace for them what was taken away from them. But what is left? The grieving family yeah. who have lost somebody, yeah. who have had someone taken away prematurely, taken away from them uh, by this act of murder. So they can choose to take blood money. So it's their choice, not the government. It's their choice. Okay, good. And they can also choose to forgive completely. And there are instances where they, 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 they well, I've personally seen with my own eyes, people wait until almost the moment of execution and forgive the person and say that I wanted the person to really appreciate the, mm-hmm. I wanted the lesson to be learned, but ultimately I, you know, I don't, 
I don't feel that I, I don't want that person to lose their life. So mm -hmm. there is that is down to the to the wali, and that's the sultan which is mentioned in the in the ayah. That's what is meant, not the sultan of taking your sword out mm -hmm. and going looking for the guy to to cut off his head. You've said that a couple of times now. You mentioned the hadith earlier about stealing an egg, and you said what's meant here is not this, but it's this. According to whose understanding? Like mm -hmm. where are you getting? So to? we have to take this from the hadith. Okay, we have to take this from the hadith. Uh, we have to take it from the the adilla. Sharia. So for example, in the stealing of the egg, we know that an egg, unless a gold egg, doesn't reach rub dinar. Mm -hmm. It doesn't reach the minimum amount. So here it's not possible that a person could steal an egg on its own and lose their hand. Sure, okay. Because it doesn't reach the hadith, and we have to reconcile all the hadith yeah. together, all the ayat together. It doesn't reach rub dinar. It doesn't reach a quarter of a of a golden dinar. Mm -hmm. So now there has to be another reason. So now we go to the statements of the scholars and we ask, how did they, how did they understand this hadith? Yeah. How did they reconcile between this and between the fact that it is it is a matter of un, uh, which is clearly understood in Islam that a person cannot uh, have this punishment carried out for something which is less than that value. And generally, what I believe to be the proper or the stronger opinion in this is that it talks about the consequences that somebody steals an egg and then tomorrow they steal right, you right. know something else and then okay. the next day and the next day until it reaches a point where they start stealing things of value and then the consequence of stealing that egg is that they ended up with the punishment carried out upon them uh, in terms of here the sultan that is mentioned here again the this the principle that we have that the hudud are the job of the Wali al-Amr. That's the Wali al-Amr's job. And if we look at just the example of the Sahaba, the Khulafar Rashidin, if we look at the example of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we see that the Wali al-Amr, either himself or either appointing someone to, to carry out that. But it's not the case that we have vigilantism in the religion of so Islam. So you have statements of like at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Umar ibn al-Khattab anhu, when something happened, he said, let me chop his head off. He's not so, the government. Okay. He, who is he asking? He's asking the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He's asking mm. the one who is in responsibility, the Wali al-Amr, O Messenger of Allah, you are the ruler here. Mm. Give me permission to carry out this punishment upon this person. Do you, do you think that there's any kind of justification for people who might be Muslims, they read these ayat and ahadith, they come across these punishments, and obviously with your knowledge, you know that this is not in their hands, it's not meant for them to carry it out, but they come across these ayat and ahadith, and they just carry out, like acts of terrorism, for example, on the street, based on these misunderstandings of these ayat. Like, do you see how people can fall into this? I think that whenever Islam is not implemented properly, and whenever uh, people don't take Islam from its proper sources, there is a danger of uh, of the rulings of Islam being misinterpreted and misunderstood. And I think that's just as true in Christianity and it's just as true in Judaism. And there are plenty of examples of, mm. uh, of that throughout history. The act of, uh, of committing acts of terror is in itself something for which there is a prescribed punishment in Islam. Mm. Allah Azza said the, the punishment of those people who wage war against Allah and His Messenger and they cause corruption in the earth, and this includes like the highway robber. Sure, uh, it includes the uh, banditry. It includes you know uh, people who commit like huge you know acts of terror and so on and so forth. And you qatelu that they be killed. Wow. Or you or crucified. Or to aidihim wa arjuluhum min khilaf, or their hands and feet cut off from opposite sides. Or you from art or expel from the earth. The scholars mentioned that each one is according to the severity of the. Uh, to the severity of the of the crime, and with regard to the crucifixion, they differed over whether it's done before the person is killed or whether it's done after, in a, in a way of showing people the severity of this, because this is one of the worst kinds of crimes, the crimes that sort of tear at the fabric of the safety of the society, like banditry, people kidnapping people from the streets, uh, robbing people, armed robberies, uh, where people you know stop people who are traveling on a road and rob them or mm. try to kill them. And likewise, terrorism, anywhere people, you know, really tear at the fabric of the safety of society and destroy, you know, the lives of many people. Those people, that's one of the most severe punishments that exists in Islam. So I think ultimately everything can be misused. Yeah. You know, we see even, uh, you know, things that are 
sort of considered to be uh, basic sort of, uh, you know, uh, teachings in, in Western countries and so on, we see groups, extreme groups come and misuse those teachings. We see in Christianity, extreme groups come and misuse the teaching of Christianity and use it for violence. Islam, every time Islam mentions, uh, for example, jihad, or Islam mentions fighting of any kind, Islam typically always you find a clear instruction in the same ayah or the following ayah not to go to extremes. وَقَاتِلُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ الَّذِينَ يُقَاتِلُونَكُمْ وَلَا تَعْتَدُوا إِنَّ, إن اللَّهَ لَا يُحِبُّ الْمُعْتَدِينَ mm. Fight those people who fought against you. Not fight innocent men and women and children on the streets. Fight the people who fought against you. وَلَا تَعْتَدُوا Don't go over the limits. Don't go over the limits that are set by Allah. And that's a, a standard feature of Whenever verses mention fighting, mention killing, and bear in mind this fighting killing is that which is done under the banner of the ruler, i.e. an organized army that takes that is organized and that is given their instructions from the Waliul Amr, not vigilantism again. They are told don't go to extremes. The Prophet said, told them not to kill the a child not to kill the woman not to break down not to break down the monasteries and the churches and the synagogues where people are worshiping Allah to leave the people alone yeah. not to uh, cut down the trees and so on and so forth islam came with with regulations for this that supersede and are better than any existing regulations right now look at the you know all this thing about the geneva convention and the rules of war and so on. islam established fair and just rules of fighting and strongly tells everybody that when you fight, you don't go to extremes. You don't go over the limits. Allah does not love the people who go over the limits that they've been set. And I think that, again, you know, the fact that Islam contains these things is problematic for some people, but they have to understand that Islam is a complete way of life. Mm. Have you ever seen a government and apart from what we're talking about, maybe the government of a tiny little island somewhere, but a, a significantly sized government that doesn't have an army. No. He, yeah. At the end of the day, we're talking about governments here. We're talking about a country that has a legitimate army. The difference being that that army is given religious instruction, not political instruction. Right. Political instruction, I'll go and do what you want. You kill these people, do, you know, I want you to make an example of them. There's no political instruction for fight. Instructions religiously, you are not allowed to do this. Religiously, you're not allowed to do that. Your purpose for fighting is a religious purpose, not a political purpose, not because I want to have double the land that I have right now. It is a purpose of making the word of Allah the highest and the word of those who disbelieve the laws. It's a topic for a, a whole you know, podcast, inshallah. But yeah, I think so, yeah. it is really important to understand that the concept of fighting existing within Islam is actually something which provides safeguards that don't exist. And I, you know, honestly, if you were to look at armies around the world today, and I want you to look at professional armies, like the likes of the, the United States, the UK, uh, Australia, you know, these are countries that have uh, professional armies with laws that govern what their soldiers do. The abuses from those soldiers have been significant and consistent, not yeah, one-off. They have been regular and consistent time and time again in war after war. They've been convicted in their own courts of doing so. Yeah. So this is something really that ultimately people who are fighting need religious guidance. Yeah. It's not barbaric. It's that you say to that you say to somebody, when you go out and fight, first of all, that this is done as part of a legitimate army that is organized and that is given its instruction from the government of that Muslim country. Secondly, that you under no circumstances, whether your commander tells you or your governor tells you or the ruler tells you, are you to kill innocent men, women and children who are not people who are not fighting against you. You are not to, uh, you know, to attack people who are worshipping Allah in their private places of worship and so on and so forth. That to me is as something which we should be proud of, not something that we should be running away from and hiding behind. The fact that people may abuse that, I think to be honest, people will look for any justification to do to do something. And any time Islam is not inter implemented properly, it's open to... And it's to never abuse. the fault of Islam, it's the implementation of the people. Absolutely. That, and it's okay. our job to, to educate people about that and to stop that from happening. And that's, mm -hmm. I, I believe it's important. You know, I'm not a person who thinks that we should shy away from the problems 
that are exist in our ummah today with young kids who yeah. fall into extremism and so on, we need to go out and tackle that. We need to show them that this is wrong and we need to show them the evidences from the Quran and the Sunnah and the actions of the companions radiallahu anhum, which prove to us that this is not a part of Islam. And when we do that and we publicize it and we say so openly, that will naturally re- decrease the number of, of, of okay. uh, people who go okay. down that route. Okay, let's go back to the issue of murder. What kind of conditions are in place here to make sure there's no miscarriage of justice or any of those other things? Mm. So again, we go back to the same principle, al-hudud, tudur aw bishubuhat, that any kind of shubha, so you mentioned this a few times uh, that this doubt, this issue of doubt, any kind of doubt means that the prescribed punishment is who's in charge of identifying whether this is a doubt or this is not a doubt. Like, so there are two things. First of all, you have the uh, the Sharia as a whole, as a, as a legislation, the Islamic law, which gives us uh, framework and principles within which to work. And you have a judge who is responsible for looking at this case and who is responsible for taking submissions from the people. So for example, the person comes and says, I did not, you know, I did not do this, mm. or I don't believe this happened, or I was not sane at the time, or, you know, anything like that. For example, someone claims insanity. Of course, the judge is going to look into the reality of that. They're going to take medical testimony. They're going to look into the reality of whether that person was sane or insane. But that is a shubha at the end of the day. Fine. That's a, a, it needs to be investigated. It needs to be investigated because if it is true that the person was not in possession of their full faculties, then we can't carry out the had upon them. There can be the potential of uh, ta'zir of discretionary punishment, but there can't be. There can't be the you know the prescribed punishment can't be carried out. I think one of the the limits that we have, or the the limiting factors we have in cases of murder, is that we have the uh, the three levels. The fact that not everyone who is killed is considered to be of this high mm. level of murder that, in, that entails uh, qisas, that entails retribution. But instead, it depends on uh, what was intended. So let, let's give an example. You have uh, accidental killing. So accidental killing is something where the person didn't take any steps to kill that person. Okay. But the end result was that the person died. Okay. You know, so it could be, for example, you're uh, driving your car yeah. and someone runs driving your car, but you're not driving your car. Uh, I mean, this issue of driving the car dangerously okay, is yeah. one that needs yeah, some yeah. looking into. But you're driving the car in you know fairly normal way, and so you you hit somebody. And at the end of the day, you, you result you cause them to die, but you didn't murder them. Yeah. Uh, accidental killing uh, is one level, but the next level up is this kind of. I don't know what, what how to how to, to frame it. In between semi, that, and murder, you know, that like, sort of semi, yeah. uh, you know, semi-accidental, is where a person might, for example, to give an example, someone goes to actually hurt somebody, right? But they they aim to hurt someone with something that la la yaktulu ghaliban. It usually it would not be expected to cause them to die. You know, it wouldn't be expected yeah. that they cause them to die. Uh, for example, let's just say they. Um, you know, they punched them a few times, you know. They they wanted to hurt them, but they didn't do so in a way that you would expect that person to die, sure. but the person died. Okay. So now this is the next level up. This is the next level up. Murder, even if a person was to say, I didn't intend to kill them, but they took steps that would be expected to result in someone's right, death. Right, right. For example, they stabbed someone to death. Yeah. And he said, well, I didn't intend to kill him. Yeah. I just intend to hurt him. I wanted to stab him just a couple of times and hurt him, he died. Yeah. Sorry, but when you pulled a knife out and you stabbed that person, you did something that is expected typically to result in someone's death. That, that is quite conceivable. That is considered to be murder in Islam of the highest degree. Even if the person's in final intention was not to actually kill that person, but it was to cause them severe harm, but they did so with something which is expected to kill somebody. Understood. Like they shot them and they said, I was only trying to shoot, shoot him in the leg or in the arm right, or something. Right, right, yeah. But ultimately you pull the gun out, you pull the trigger. You know what typically happens when you shoot a person is that there is a high chance of that person, that person is going to die. Then that is considered to that be- That makes sense. That's considered what about, to be What about the issue of witnesses? Does that play a part in murder? Absolutely. Witnesses are a part of all of the Islamic uh, the Islamic uh, punishments and the Islamic legal system is you have to have witnesses. We said that zina is extremely high, high standard of, of, of witness to the point where it's, a poly, almost a yeah, yeah. it's almost has no existence, yeah. you know. Uh, as for the others, then it requires typically, even in the issue of stealing and others, it requires 
two witnesses that are considered to be of sound mind, of re- uh, suitable you know, level of religious practice, people of who are known to be truthful, people who have no um, ulterior motives and so on and so forth. So yeah, okay. there are the witnesses are also required. Uh, and again, if there aren't any witnesses, and, and this is really interesting because how does Islam see things like CCTV and DNA and forensics and things like that? Typically, this is considered not to be of the of the level of of, of a witness, but it's considered to be a a karina, a supporting right. evidence right, okay. for something. And that you know, people sometimes turn around and say that that is uh, you know s- such a you know why you know why we've got these scientific methods. Why are these not primary? That poor victim that they've yeah. gone through this why, clearly. Why you can not, see it on TV. Yeah, why are they not primary? Yeah, we are now starting to see in our time the dangers of relying upon those as primary evidences, miscarriages of justice where DNA was contaminated, deep fake videos where videos are not done properly or where they're misrepresented or where it didn't show the person. A lot of miscarriages of justice are coming from that. So Islam doesn't say the person will not be punished, but they will not have the had carried out. What they will have is if the judge believes there is a sufficient amount of evidence around that, in terms of things like CCTV and DNA and so on, then the, the judge may carry out a discretionary punishment. Uh, but the had will not be done. And I think that if you were to look at, even though in the beginning when these things came out, people believed they were the answer to everything. I think if you look now, we've seen significant numbers of miscarriages of justice around these areas, which do make sense that they should be they should fall under discretionary punishment rather than the mm. rather than the had. And the had really has a very high standard of of proof, but isn't really there an does. argument that the, the same thing could occur with two human beings? The eye could be flawed; they could be seeing something that they thought they genuinely did see. They're two witnesses, but they didn't see it quite right. And mm. but I and suppose that would absolutely. be the doubt. That, that would, would be the doubt, and mm. also it's the judge's job to make sure that this is investigated properly. The point is that Islam put a very, very high standard, higher typically than what I would say exists in in modern legal systems. The mm. standard of proof or the burden of proof in Islam is typically higher than most modern legal systems. And the reason for that is, again, because the emphasis is on deterrence and to reduce the number of miscarriages of justice, because that is a major argument. Many of the people who have concerns over these punishments, their biggest concern are miscarriages of justice. Yeah, yeah. And if we can reduce the number of miscarriages of justice, obviously Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Will uh, Allah Azza wa Jal will recompense a person on the day of resurrection? There's no doubt about that. But we want to make it a system whereby there are extremely small numbers of miscarriages of justice, or, you know, as minimal as possible, to make it such that people have confidence in the the wisdom behind uh, these punishments. Okay, let's move on to another topic where um, it's considered to be not a crime for many many people. And that is the issue of apostasy. Someone being a Muslim, changing their mind effectively and leaving the religion. What's the ruling on this? Mm. So there's no doubt that the punishment for apostasy is death. It's capital. It's, it's, a, it's a crime that is considered to be worthy of capital punishment. And I think there are a couple of things that you need to bear in mind. I think it's what, what really interests me about apostasy and the punishment for apostasy is who would actually have this punishment carried out upon them? Okay. So let's say a person decides that I no longer want to be a Muslim. Okay. First of all, what is the punishment that person is going to get on the day of resurrection? It's huge. Eternal punishment in hellfire. hellfire. Yeah. yeah, we all agree on that. Yeah. I would say having a severe punishment in this world is a significant uh, blessing and mercy in comparison to what the punishment is in the hereafter in terms of discouraging people from going down this route. But let's keep on this topic. Individual makes that decision personally. What are they going to do? They decide, I'm going to leave this Muslim country. I I can't live here anymore. They decide to leave. They privately, you know, get on a plane. They go to a non-Muslim country and they live happily ever after until the punishment of Allah comes upon them and that's their what issue. If they, what if they've got family in the Muslim country? They want to remain there. They want to live their life like they a remain, normal citizen. Okay, so they live their life like a normal citizen. But they, they don't but, publicize their beliefs. You're going to see where I'm coming to in a second, yeah? Okay, but now they're eating during Ramadan and people are saying, why? Why? Okay. You know, it's a difficult life to live. Yeah. You have to pretend to be a Muslim. difficult life to live. Yeah, difficult life to live. 
The other person publicizes it, invites other people to it, says publicly that I have renounced my religion, like the munafiqun used to do as well in the time of uh, the Prophet ﷺ, where one of the phases they went through was they went through a phase of telling people that they were Muslim and then at the end of the day, they would say to the people, oh, we've renounced our religion in order to make other people renounce their religion. Mm. This is the one who you expect the punishment of apostasy will be carried out upon. Okay, I, have to, I, w- I want to go into two questions there. First of all, you mentioned which me and you would both agree that the punishment from Allah after death on the day of judgment is eternal hellfire for this person. How would you approach this conversation with a non-Muslim who doesn't necessarily believe in that, yet you're still advocating for this huge punishment for apostasy in this world? I think that ultimately you have to uh, take this discussion in the context of the whole of the religion of Islam. I don't think you can take this discussion out of the religion of Islam and the existence of God and the right of Allah to legislate. And, you know, I don't think you can you can just take this out of there and keep it on its own. You have to have muqaddimat. You have to make the person, the person has to understand the existence of God, uh, the law of God, the right of God to be worshipped alone, the crime of making a partner with God. And that has to be there. Otherwise, you're trying to have a discussion based on no foundation. There is nothing you agree upon. And person I don't believe God exists. So why is there a punishment for apostasy? Mm. That's like saying, I don't believe that murder is wrong. Why is there a punishment for murder? Yeah. Like yeah. at the end of the day, we have to have some kind common of common ground, ground yeah. that we stand upon. Okay, the second question I have is that you mentioned that the person who makes a private personal decision that I no longer believe in this religion, as long as they don't go out publicizing it, I I don't see how the punishment would be, how would they be discovered? That's fine. My my, my point in this is not actually that they shouldn't be deserving of the punishment. I believe they're deserving of uh, it. It's actually that I believe that really the person this is being, that this is really targeted towards is to stop the spread of apostasy in the society. (laughs) This has been known that you're a fever yourself and you were previously a Christian. Okay. And you were living in a non-Muslim country. And then you decided that Islam is the truth and you've gone on to publicize that and even call people to Beautiful. it. And like, ima- imagine, I, I imagine if that was a rule in Christianity. Yeah. Where really, would you be? Where would I be? I wouldn't be, have announced my Islam in that country. I would have quietly made my way out to a nice <laughs> Muslim country and then stood, you know, on the member Yom al-Jumu'ah and said to everyone, I've become a Muslim and I'm not going back to that country because they, those people are going to execute me for mm. choosing the truth. I mean, I don't think you can compare Islam to anything else. But the, I do see where you're coming from, but I just personally here in this issue of apostasy, I really think that when you see the wisdom of what this does to the whole society and the severity of this crime and the severity of what it leads to and the need for deterrence, the need for retribution and the safeguard, the fact that this guy is caught and then just the, the punishment is carried out, you know, that that opens up to some questions, but the fact that they're given an option to recant, to repent, and they still persist with it. I think, you know, a person, if it was the other way around in Christianity, you've got two choices. Either you die as a martyr, or either you keep it quiet and get out of the country. And what did the Sahaba do in Mecca when mm. they were in under threat of, of, of being killed for choosing their religion? Some of them uh, sacrificed themselves and some of them concealed their Islam until they could leave. Okay. I, I think that is reasonable when this law is publicized and known about so how how do you reckon you say it's publicized and known about how do you reconcile this with the various ayat in the quran that seem to go against this like for example okay. mm. if whoever d- no wants to believe then let them believe like so deen, deal- a deen, all of these ayat yeah. that suggest that it's okay to have different belief systems okay. so that's not what those ayat suggest but let's take them one by one uh, this statement of Allah Azza wa Jal, mm-hmm. This statement is a statement of tawbiq. It's a rebuke that whoever wants to believe, let them believe and let them have the consequences of their belief. Mm-hmm. And whoever wants to disbelieve, let them disbelieve and let them have the consequences of their disbelief. Fi dunya wa It's not approval. It's not approval. Okay. How do you know that it's not approval? Because Allah Azza wa Jal, Allah Yarda. Uh, Allah Azza wa Jal la yarda li ibadihi al-kufr Allah Azza wa Jal is not content for his slaves to disbelieve is not pleased for his slaves to disbelieve Is there a clear cut ayah in the Quran that says Islam is the only religion? Inna deena inda Allah al-Islam wa man yabata ghiyayra al-Islam deena fa la yuqbala min wa huwa fil akhirati min al-khasirin So you have to understand those verses within light of the clear cut As for la ikraha fi al-deen This is actually something which again is completely true Some of the ulama said this ayah is mansukha It's been abrogated by the ayat of jihad and so on 
However, the correct opinion is that it's not abrogated here. This ayah, la ikraha fi deen, there is no compulsion in religion, is that not that there will not be consequences for the religion that you choose or the choices that you make, but that ultimately nobody can, uh, or if you were compelled to accept a religion, that wouldn't be accepted by Allah. Ikhlas is a condition of la ilaha illallah, right? Yeah. So it's compelled. And that's why people are not compelled. There is no compelling. And that's why the hadith of the Prophet says, umirtu an uqatil an nas. Mm. It doesn't say umirtu an aqtul an nas. I was commanded to slaughter the people. I was commanded to fight against the people. They're given an option. Either you accept Islam. If they are from the Jews, the Christians, and some other groups, they're given the option to pay the jizya, to live under the Muslim army's protection and to have their religion as it is or they're given the option to fight. That is an option that's given to them. Nobody is saying to them, become Muslim. Uh, yani a person is forced into Islam like that. Rather, a person has consequences. That's a different aspect. A person chooses not to be Muslim. There are consequences to that in the dunya and in the akhirah. But that isn't a compulsion. Okay. Ultimately, if a person was compelled to accept a religion, that wouldn't be accepted from them. You have to accept Islam freely. You have to choose. And the last ayah, لَكُمْ دِينُكُمْ وَلَيَدِينَ The popular ayah, what is this, what is this meaning? To your, okay. you, your religion and to us, our religion. This is explaining the difference uh, or the distinguishing or the bara'a, the, the freedom of the Muslim, the disassociation of the Muslim from other religions. It's not permitting them like that. It's okay to have your religion. That's not what it says. You have your religion. I have my, my religion is distinct from your religion. And let's simply just look at the first ayat. قُلْ يَا أَيُّهَا الْكَافِرُونَ لَا أَعْبُدُوا مَا تَعْبُدُونَ وَلَا أَنْتُمْ عَابِدُونَ مَا أَعْبُدُ وَلَا أَنَا عَابِدٌ مَا عَبَدْتُمْ وَلَا أَنْتُمْ عَابِدُونَ مَا أَعْبُدُ All of the tafsir of the ayah is found in the first ayat. I'm not going to worship what you worship. You don't worship what I worship. You and me, we're not on the same page when it comes to religion. لَكُمْ دِينُكُمْ وَلِيَدِينَ And not that you are permitted to have your religion. There's a difference between what Allah Azza wa Jal allowed qadaran in terms of his qadr, irada kawniya, qadariya that Allah Azza wa Jal decreed, and what Allah Azza wa Jal loves. Allah Azza wa Jal does not love for his servants to disbelieve. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, I want to move the discussion to a topic that is linked closely to the issue of apostasy, and that is um, blasphemy. What does the Sharia say about people who insult the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, for example, or Allah or the religion of Islam? So insulting the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is a had from the hudud of Allah Azza wa Jal. And it is like apostasy, it is an example of capital punishment. But here the scholars distinguish between two things. Okay. They say that in apostasy, there is a, a mas'ala, uh, uh, the tawbah of the murtad. Is it accepted or not? Is a person given a chance to repent or not? When they, If they uh, apostatize, they, they leave Islam. Are they given a chance to repent or not? The person who commits insulting the Prophet and uh, you know, blaspheming and, and insulting the Prophet this person has done two things. First of all, they have committed ridda if they were any apostasy, if they were okay, if they Muslim. were Muslim, okay. But they, there's a second aspect to it which is different, which is the haq of the Prophet the right of the Prophet Now we know the Prophet what he uh, sacrificed personally for the religion of Islam, yeah. and that his right is higher than the right of anyone else. Yeah. And we also know that Islam gave rights to individuals. So for example, Islam uh, gave the right of, uh, for example, uh, punishments to be carried out against people who insult other people, for example. Uh, for example, a qadr, as an example, accusing someone of adult, falsely accusing someone of adultery. Islam has a system of preventing these things from taking place. But the right of the Prophet ﷺ is greater than anyone else's right. Mm. And typically the system of Islam, generally speaking, is that forgiveness has to come in sahib al-haq. Forgiveness has to come from the person who was insulted. Mm -hmm. The Prophet ﷺ has passed away. Yeah. His honor has to be preserved and protected for a religious benefit, let alone for a personal benefit, not just him and himself and what he did for this ummah, but also in terms of the religious danger behind that and the leading, spreading to apostasy. All the things we said about apostasy, how it spreads in the society and so on and so forth. Yeah. But the Prophet ﷺ has that right personally, that Allah ﷻ gave him that personal right. So now, without having a means to forgiveness for sahib al-haq, it's not possible now for the person who the crime was committed against is not able now to forgive that person. So in this case, the punishment has 
a different aspect to apostasy. And that's why the, the scholars differed over the issue of uh, the tawbah of the person who insults the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, insult him and then they make tawbah from that. I think it's a very public statement of uh, of defiance. It's not something which is again done privately and that we've discussed that in apostasy. We'll not go back around that uh, discussion again. But we had discussed the issue of the fact it's a very public statement yeah. and it's a very deliberate attempt to um, to personally attack the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He has a right that is given to him by Allah Azza wa Jal. That right is more than deserving if we look at his position in terms of what he's done for uh, for for this religion yeah. and his position in terms of the best of mankind and the fact that Islam gives similar uh, rights in terms of the right for your honor to be protected, the right for your for you not to be uh, ridiculed and insulted is given to everybody in society, Muslim, non-Muslim, who are living within that Muslim yeah. society anyway. The fact that his right is a level above that is, again, fairly consistent in terms of that. It does have an aspect of ridda in it. It does overlap with apostasy, but it is different because at the end of the day, it's not only an act of disbelief, whether it's done by a Muslim or non-Muslim, it's mm. not only an act of disbelief and an open act of defiance, but it's also a crime against an individual, not just against Allah. And a crime against an individual typically has to be forgiven by the individual. Mm. So that's the reason why there's a difference here between apostasy of someone entering into Islam and then leaving it, whereas this blas blasphemous act could be could occur from Absolutely. a non-Muslim. I really want to emphasize in blasphemy that we have seen cases where the accusation is that blasphemy laws are misused okay. um, in particular countries in order to punish minorities. And this is something that Islam, if it is true, and I, I don't make any judgment about, it's not me to, for me to sit here and make a judgment about whether that's actually true or not. But Islam does not in, in itself approve of or allow for the misuse of blasphemy law. Like in other words, for someone to just say, oh, I heard my neighbor say this or something like that. And we mentioned that several times. The issue of tawbah is an issue which the scholars differed over. Is it allowed? And they differed over the murtad as well. The problem is if we go into too many differences, we might be here a long time. Yeah, of course, of course. There are differences of opinion about whether this person's tawbah is accepted or not. Uh, as for the likes of Ka'b ibn Ashraf, for example, and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi commanding for him to be killed, he uh, this is something where the Sahaba took permission from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi So I want to be clear, there's no vigilantism here. Okay. Yeah. They took permission. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said, who will take care of Ka'b ibn Ashraf? Now bear in mind, as the leader of the country, hmm. And I really, I, I want to put this in context. As a leader of a country, aside from religion, as a leader of a country, for him to uh, put a bounty on the head of someone is not something which is unfamiliar to us, in even in modern times, yeah. in terms of the leaders of countries and, and the, the heads of government saying, this person, there is a bounty placed on their head. This person, we as a, as a government are seeking to uh, to uh, find this person and to carry out an act of capital punishment upon this individual. That is something that is not actually strange, to be honest. Uh, it's something which pick your country and the United States and all the others, many of them do on a fairly regular basis. The difference in Islam is that there is a reason for it and there is a framework. It's not just for someone to get up one morning and say, Oh, you know, get rid of this guy because he's my political opponent. Get rid of this guy. This is something which is a religious, uh, it has a religious framework to it and a religious reasoning. And that is actually a safeguard rather than a cause for abuse and shock. Yeah, and I think that safeguard is definitely in place there when the Prophet ﷺ himself is the leader of the country or the Muslims, for example. As you go down the generations and you have people like Hajjaj ibn Yusuf, for example, do you think that Islam places too much control in the, the leader of a country and just allows him to do whatever he wants. I don't think that it is uh, that Al Hajjaj ibn Yusuf is is a good example of uh, a Muslim leader. Hmm. I think that the statement of of some of the tabi'in that Al Hajjaj is the punishment of Allah upon you is sufficient in as in hmm. order to prove that yeah. Al Hajjaj ibn Yusuf was not a good example. People fled from his rulership into the you know into the the governorship of Umar bin Abdulaziz rahimahullah ta'ala. At the same time, uh, some of the the people of his time believed that Al-Hajjaj was not a Muslim. They believed that he had left Islam. But we believe that the correct opinion is that Al-Hajjaj was, was a Muslim. 
he was a person who was zalim, he was very oppressive, and he killed a lot of people without right, and ultimately he will have to answer to Allah Azza wa Jalla Yawm Al-Qiyamah for that. Um, I don't believe that Islam is responsible for that. I think that Islam itself has all of the relevant rules and restrictions, but I think that this is a nature of Bani Adam, you know, that human beings, if they, uh, when they oppress others, no doubt those in power typically have a greater ability to oppress others. And that's why from the seven who will be shaded under the throne of Allah on the day when there is no shade of it. But his, the first mm-hmm. one mentioned is Imam Adil, a just Imam, because when you have that degree of power, you have an army. Look at the world today. Look at the democratic, you know, liberal countries and the oppression that they do and the killing that has been done in their name, extrajudicial uh, killings and so on and so forth. This shows us that the most liberal of societies are not free of this. Yeah. I believe that what Islam gives us ultimately is it gives us justice. It gives us a framework how we should live. If we don't live according to that framework and we transgress that framework, we will be responsible. Not for dunya, either in the dunya or either, and more importantly, in the akhirah. So I think, why not? Why don't we take Umar bin Abdul Aziz as our example of, you know, uh, how a Muslim ruler should behave? Of course, there are better examples among the Sahaba, the likes of the Khulafa al Rashidin and Muawiyah radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Ardahu radiallahu anhum. These are better examples than Umar bin Abdul Aziz. But just to take someone at the same yeah, time as yeah, Hajjaj bin yeah, Yusuf, yeah, yeah, we have Umar bin Abdul Aziz and the fact that in the time of that, of Umar bin Abdul Aziz, who implemented Islam, we believe implemented Islam as it should have been implemented, as the ruler is supposed to behave. Do you see people walking around without hands and people being stoned to death every five minutes no. and people, you know, this guy lost his head. To be honest, what you actually see is a time of such safety, such safety that it's just, you. when you read the 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 descriptions and the historical reports of how safe and happy people were in that time, you actually see the value of the of the Islamic system of punishments and the Islamic system of justice. That when it's implemented properly, the deterrent is so great that yeah. people just don't commit the crime. And they said in the time of Abdul Aziz, people would come with sadaqah to the extent that they couldn't find anyone to take. I mean, forget about theft. Wow. They couldn't find anyone who would be willing to take their sadaqah. And that is what happens when you implement Islam properly. And no doubt in the time of Al-Hajjaj bin Yusuf, there was a great amount of, of tyranny and a great amount of killing. And that was the result of not implementing the religion properly as the likes of uh, Al-Hasan al-Basri and others, uh, Rahimullah ta'ala said. Okay, uh, we're coming towards the uh, the latter part of our specific issues that I wanted to discuss. Um, I do want to just talk generally as people have a general perception of Islam being quite a bloodthirsty religion. And since we're on the topic of killing, there is a hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari <laughs> okay. that I would like to uh, I'd like to read out to you, inshallah. Good. Uh, Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sent us on a mission and said, if you find so-and-so and so-and-so, burn both of them with fire. When we intended to depart, Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, I have ordered you to burn so and so and so and so, and it is none but Allah who punishes with fire. So if you find them, kill them. I don't burn them, but kill them. So here again, I think we can just answer this all in the context of what we said. We said that now burning with fire is not permissible. It's not a permissible uh, method of execution okay. for the Muslim ruler. And there are some some situations in which there is there are matters where there is a, a difference of opinion in certain limited situations. But typically, we're going to say that from this hadith we've taken, that's not not an option. Yeah. The option is for the Muslim ruler that is that not they are not allowed to take the to take the life of a person illa bil haq except with right. So the Prophet ﷺ, he has a right. We know for certain the Prophet ﷺ doesn't. The person who is sent rahmatan lil alamin as a mercy to all mankind doesn't command something like that illa bil haq except that there is a right which Allah has given him to do that as the ruler as the one in authority as the prophet with religious and political authority at that time he has commanded that this these two people yeah. have committed a crime but that they must be punished in a way that is uh appropriate and allowed in Islam. So and I we've think does discussed in details those those crimes that result in capital yes, punishment. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, final thing I want to move on to is, uh, and I really just want to touch on this because I think this probably warrants a podcast on its own, and it's the issue of slavery. You've come to this podcast saying, I'm so proud of the Sharia. It's like the perfect ideal system. If that's the case, then why did it not abolish slavery? 
I think there are two uh, things to look at here, two very separate things, or three. The first thing I want to get out of people's mind is slavery as we know it today in in the term in western terms i western terms but in 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 what we have learned in history yeah. recent history yeah. okay so that slavery based on kidnapping people based on uh, race uh, based on color that has no place in islam and never had any place in islam that is from the slavery of jahiliyyah mm. that was practiced before islam where people would be kidnapped and sold into slavery this is something which is from the major sins in islam and is worthy of severe punishment Slavery in Islam is a replacement or an alternative to the system of prisoners of war. Mm. That's what it is. So you are fighting against the people, they're fighting against you. Sword to sword, gun to gun, the fighting takes place between the two armies. And when one army overcomes the other, Allah Azawajal gave a right to enslave those that remain. All of those that remain. This that is a choice now of the Muslim uh, commander has three choices. Is that not what happened at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with the issue of Banu Quraida, when the companion said, kill all the men and enslave all of the women? So let's come to Bani Quraida. We'll come to Bani Quraida. Okay. I, I want to come to Bani Quraida. I think that's important. That's an important uh, topic. But that is actually not a war. There was no war between the Muslims and Bani Quraida. We're talking about now slavery as a result of war. war. Okay. Okay. This is effectively what we would call today prisoner, being a prisoner of war. The first thing is the Muslim uh, commander has three choices. The first choice is to free them, all of them, let them all go. The second choice is to ransom them. So that is to imprison them and to ransom each individual as was done in the battle of Badr. And the third is to enslave them. When they are enslaved, I want to understand, what I wanted to show you is that people have this idea of slavery. Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, he said, لَوْلَ jihad." If it wasn't for jihad and being good to my mother, I would have wished to die as a slave. The slave is clothed from the clothing that the person, the owner has. They're fed. They're not burdened with what they can't bear. Now I want you to see treatment of prisoners of war mm. today. Yeah. Okay. I, I'm, I'm reluctant to give examples. Okay. Yeah. But let's just take, and maybe it's not a great example, but let's just take Guantanamo as an example yeah. of, of prisoners, yeah. you know, in between them, whether they're prisoners of war or whatever, but people who are imprisoned as a result of some sort of fighting that's going between yeah. and the treatment that is given. Let's look at Japanese prisoners of war in the Second World War and how they were treated. Wallahi, the Islamic system of slavery is far, far more merciful, especially when you add a final element, and that is the encouragement of freeing a slave. How many sins are there in Islam that the expiation for that sin is yeah. free a slave? Islam didn't come to enslave people. Islam came to bring people out of slavery to other people and into the slavery of Allah Azza That's what Islam came for. Yeah. However, you have to have a system for prisoners of war. What do we do? We just lock them all up. We lock them all up and then mistreat them, you know, as um, yeah, around yeah, the world. Yeah, yeah. And I gave fair the example point, of America, point. not because we're talking about Muslims, but because we're talking about a, a country that prides itself on human rights and how, you know, force feedings and all that type yeah. of stuff that takes place or you bring them into your house, they work uh, for you, you clothe them, you feed them, you look after them, and then you free them whenever you mess up. <laughs> to be honest- There's no comparison really, is there? It really yeah. is a system, but the problem is that this word slavery yeah. has been tainted by slavery that was based on kidnapping people, that was based on color, that was based on race. That slavery was practiced by who? Not by the Muslims. The Muslims were the ones being enslaved. You know, how many of those people were taken from Africa and brought over to the States in the time of, uh, of slavery mm. were ulama of Islam, some of them. Scholars of Islam, people who were people of knowledge who were kidnapped for no other crime than the color of their skin. And they were kidnapped and brought to the United States. That's the slavery of the West, not the slavery of Islam. I, I think that's fine when you're talking about prisoners of war, like you have done. But when I mentioned Bani Quraida, you actually said that this wasn't a situation of prisoners of war. You, you no, Bani Quraida was, was much worse. Okay, so you have a situation where the Muslim army or the Muslims came to people and Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh said, Take, uh, he said, uh, enslave their women and children, kill everyone with pubic hair and take... Uh, their wealth and share it amongst the Muslims. Yes. And you're right that in the context of the Muslim leader, he'd have to go for approval. And that's exactly what he did. And the Prophet said, he has ruled by what Allah has sent down. 
by what how, Allah judged over above the seven heavens. How do you justify that? Okay, first of all, let's understand what Bani Quraidah did because it wasn't a war between Bani Quraidah and between the Muslims. Okay. What Bani Quraidah did is they betrayed the Muslims in the Battle of the Khandaq. Okay. So the Battle of the Khandaq was one of the worst situations the Muslims had to endure. They had all the armies of the, the Arabian Peninsula came against them and they had agreements of... Uh, oaths and agreements and treaties with various tribes that promised that they would they would defend the Muslims. Not only did Bani Quraidah break their promise mm. and go back, but they also put the Muslim women and children under threat. And they opened the option to attack the Muslim women and children who were protected in Medina through their treachery. Now, this was an act of treachery. It was not a war situation. This was an act of of treachery and an act of betrayal and an act of treason. A treason traditionally is one of the strongest punishments. Even today, in countries which have abolished the death penalty typically, they haven't abolished it for treason. Yeah. There remains on the legal statutes that, tr that treason to that extent, utter betrayal and treason and breaking of your treaties and agreements, uh, especially when it endangers the life of innocent people, is something which deserves a very severe punishment. You don't think... Now, I'm, I'm going to go come to the whole story now. Now, when the punishment was going to be carried out upon them, these were people who followed the Jewish law. And the Jewish law was more severe than what Islam put upon them. And they knew that. They knew that if they were to be judged by the law of the Torah, that they would actually suffer worse than and more horrific punishment than what they suffered at the hands of the Muslims. So what they decided is that they were not happy for the Prophet ﷺ to decide what happened to them. So the Prophet ﷺ, as the leader of the Muslims, agreed on something. He said, I want you to appoint your own judge. You choose from among the people someone who is going to judge what should be done for this treason and this betrayal that you've done. And I will, I will agree. I will not intervene. Okay. So they chose one of their close friends in Jahiliyyah, Sa'd ibn Mu'adh radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He was their, you know, their close confidant, a close ally of them in Jahiliyyah. They said, Sa'd is not going to let us down here. You know, Sa'd is not going to give us any of this, uh, the punishments of the Torah. Sa'd here is going to, you know, is going to go easy on us. So Sa'd had been wounded in the, in the, in the battle of the Khandaq radiallahu anhu, and he was on the verge of death. Okay. And they brought him because of this treachery and they, they wanted him. And the Prophet said, okay, I will not intervene. I'm not going to intervene in this judgment. Whatever Sa'ad is going to judge for you as the Muslim ruler, I am going to agree to his judgment. It's his choice. Mm -hmm. And they said, Sa'ad, you know, as, you know, you know, it was between us in Jahiliyyah. And Sa'ad ruled that the males, adult males among them, yeah. not children, the adult males among them be killed. They're the ones who fought in the war. They're the ones who betrayed. All of the adult males were required to fight in the war. That's how wars work, right? All the adult males, yeah. they okay. were the ones who were killed because they were the ones who deliberately uh, peddled that treachery. Mm. Now they have been considered to be at war with us because they committed an act of war right. against the Muslims. Right. They opened the Muslim women and children to attack. They opened the Muslims to be attacked from the, by the Confederate army from behind. They betrayed the Muslims in a way that was nothing short of treason. Now their property becomes war booty for the Muslims because now there is, this is an act of war now. So we are going to now treat the innocent among you or the ones who are not participating in the war as prisoners of war mm -hmm. under the normal rules of right. prisoners of which war. Which we discussed. Previously. Which we discussed under the normal rules of prisoners of war, and those who committed the treachery are going to have to pay the price of treason, which the way that they were killed is far, far less than what was per, what they were expecting from the law of the Torah. Yeah. When the Prophet ﷺ heard of the judgment of Sa'ad, remember he's, he's put his hands up and said, whatever Sa'ad says, I'm going to go with it. I'm not going to intervene. He said, you have judged by what Allah judged with me, فوق السبع سبعات. Above the seven heavens. And this was a judgment that Allah was pleased with. It was a judgment that was in accordance with Islam. And it's very important that that remains as a, a penalty that is visible for people in terms of treason. And it, it was a big lesson for the other tribes around in the Arabian Peninsula that you cannot make a promise of an oath that you will defend a people and then break your oath and be treacherous in your oath because that is something which 
put the lives of really all of the Muslims in danger. And it was an act of treason, so it was dealt with as such. I'm coming towards the end of the questions that I've got for you, but I do want to touch on something that we briefly mentioned before. We spoke about the different methods of capital punishment, and we talked about why not modernize them when they were, and you mm. said that rightly so, that there were quicker punishments at the time, but we, the, the, uh, Allah still chose to issue this particular punishment or this particular method. Um, however, there is a wider discussion that needs to be had about, we've mentioned so much about murder and killing and sto and stoning and things like that, that perhaps that was the culture at the time. Perhaps that was the culture at the time for the people at the time. However, now the world has become what many people say much more civilized. Is there maybe a push to change some of these punishments into more modern punishments and modernize the Sharia? So I think there's a, a couple of answers to that. I think, first of all, if you look at the Islamic punishments, uh, we'll set aside stoning as a as something we've discussed earlier. Yeah. But primarily the punishment being carried out by the sword, that is actually something that is relatively, in fact, out of all of the punishments that are available today in modern times, it's actually one of the most humane and the most um, sort of in terms of the way it's carried out, it's easy to carry out. It doesn't have very much room for error. It's relatively quick and you know, painless to the person it's carried out. Yeah, perhaps I'm not talking so about... So I'm, I'm coming to the point you're okay, talking about. Okay. I'm just sort of saying that I, I don't, for in that sense, I don't see there to be any, even any reasonable grounds for talking about. If you look at the situation with lethal injection yeah. right now, if you look at the situation with electrocution and so on, none of those are any better than, and in fact, all of them are worse mm. than what Islam puts forward. That's okay. that's one point. Um, Now on this topic of modernizing Sharia. Mm. I think that the first of all, the one of the things we have to start with is we have to start with the statement of Allah Today I have completed my favor upon you. Today I have completed your religion for you, completed my favor upon you and chosen for you Islam as your religion. What Allah chose for us on that day is for us today. It's not for us to modify it. It's not for us to need to modernize it. It is the perfect system from Al-Hakim, Al-Alim, Al-Khabir. It doesn't need to be updated. It doesn't need to be modernized. It doesn't need to be changed. And I would provide an evidence for that, not only from the Sharia point of view, but even from the a logical point of view, is what I alluded to at the beginning of the failure of modern legal systems to address the problems in the society. It's quite clear that these modern systems are not doing the job. They're not, they're just not effective. They're not doing the job. And I think that when you bring Islam as a whole, and I've keep, I keep emphasizing this, yeah. we really have shone a light, a very strong light on the Islamic uh, sort of punishments, legal punishments, things like that, criminal law and things like that. Mm. That doesn't show the whole picture of, of Islam. Islam is not a society where there's just a row of people with swords raised above their heads waiting to chop things off. You know, that's not what Islam is about. And that's never been what Islam is about. You have to put that in context as a necessary deterrent to ensure safety, security, and peace for everyone in the society. That doesn't need to change. It doesn't need to be updated. In fact, we need to go back to that. We need to go back to punishments that actually make a difference, punishments that actually provide some kind of retribution on behalf of the victim, punishments that more than anything stop other people from going into it. وَلَكُمْ فِي الْقِصَاصِ حَيَا you have life in the law of retribution. You actually stop people from going down this route. And also punishments that are not a burden upon regular people where we have to pay for keeping some really horrific and evil people behind bars. Mm. And we, we have to kind of pay for that. So I don't see any logical reason and I certainly don't see any shari reason to change what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. If anything, we need to go back to that implemented properly. When it's not implemented properly, then that's not representative of what Islam has. Speaking of going back, do we not go back to the scholars that preceded us? For example, there's the 8th century Maliki scholar, Abu Qasim al-Burzuli, who actually called for the replacement of the, the hudud, as mm. we describe them today, with things like financial penalties. Mm. What do you have to say about that? I don't think that's actually a, a correct quote uh, from Abu Qasim uh, ta'ala, Maliki scholar. Uh, I believe what the discussion is, is what I alluded to earlier about the, not about the financial penalties as a replacement for the hudud, but as financial penalties in terms of ta'zir. Mm -hmm. Is it allowed 
for a judge to implement a financial penalty. And I did allude earlier to the fact that the jumhur of the ulama, the majority from the Hanafiya, the Malikiya, the Shafi'iya, and the Hanabila, they held the, permission, the, the, the opinion that it's not permissible, that financial penalties are not a tool that is available to the Qadi in that sense, except where there is a clear evidence in Islam for that. Uh, and Sheikh Islam ibn Taymiyyah and others, and among them others from those we've quoted, they held the opinion that it is permissible to introduce financial penalties on the in the aspect of discretionary punishment. That is what I have understood from what I have read. Okay. I did go through the book uh, today and I did look at some of the quotes earlier on. And from what I can see, and again, we can look at this in more research, we can bring it in the Q&A if there are further things to look at. But what I can see from this is this discussion is about the use of discretionary financial punishment and no, nothing to do with replacing the hudud. What about the argument that the, the world has changed, which is evident? I don't think either of us would disagree with that. The world has changed since then. It has become more cosmopolitan, it's become more multicultural. That inevitably will have an impact on things like crime has increased. And, yeah, crime People is increasing. People are less safe. So <laughs> these kind of things that have, with, even not aside from those facts, which I agree they are facts, but aside from those, even the fact that the technology has just changed the way we live. And the 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 day to day transactions that are taking place nowadays are just so different. How can we refer to laws that were based around seventh century Arabia and still believe that despite the world changing so much that it's still applicable to today? So I think there are two things here. I think first of all, the fundamentals of, of human interaction haven't changed. Murder is murder. Mm. Murder today is murder. Yeah. We haven't got to the level where murder is like someone deleting your social media account or something like that. <laughs> yeah. You know, like murder is murder. Yeah. Yeah. Zina is zina. Uh, and so on, those fundamentals haven't changed. And those are fundamental human, uh, they are crimes against humanity on a, on a human, on a, on a level of humanity. And it's generally in every society, they are considered to be really terrible, horrific crimes. Things like murder, um, you know, adultery, fornication, and so on. That is one aspect. The second aspect is that as we've mentioned in, in several, you know, several times, Islam provides a framework for dealing with what we call nawazil and mustajiddat. Now, murder is not a nazila. I'm sorry, murder is not something new that turned up yesterday. Mm. Neither is fornication something new. Neither is apostasy something new that turned up last week. We also talked about the Jewish law of stoning to death for the one who invites someone to another religion and so on. This is not something that turned up last week. These are not nawazil, they're not mustajiddat. They're not new issues that need to be looked at in the in the concept of or in the framework of Islam. They're just simply things that were there before, they're there now, and they have their rulings. However, if there are no as like financial crimes, right? And says we talked about theft being theft from a place of safety, a hirs, a place of safety and security. What does that represent in terms of Bitcoin? Mm -hmm. That is a nazila. It's a new issue that needs to be looked at in light of the Islamic evidences through things like qawaid principles, qiyas, analogy, uh, other tools that are available to the mujtahid uh, in order to determine where this sits or what the conditions sit in terms of the laws under punishments for theft. When is it a discretionary uh, punishment and when is it a had min hududillahi azza wa jal? That is something which is looked at in the framework of what Islam is giving some things. There's plenty of guidelines. For example, the use of the word hirs. Hirs here in theft is a place of safety and security that could be potentially considered to be as digital as well as uh, as well as physical mm. because the yeah. word used is broad okay. but that's for the scholars and the mujtahidun to look at and to analyze and then to apply the rulings of islam to them islam adapts to changes in the world changes in the world are nawazil allah azawajal adapts the religion of islam to them through principles and through the tools that are available in ijtihad. As for things that have always existed and still exist today, yeah. those don't need reform. Okay, you mentioned in there the principles, and you mentioned something like al-qawa'id al-fiqhiyah, for example. Is it not one of those principles, al-adam al-hakama, that the customs can play an impact on a ruling? For example, when we talk about the ruling of a woman not being allowed to travel, Many scholars say that there isn't a set distance, it's rather what the, the, of, like, the customs of the people define as traveling. So this has a um, this has a, an important principle that comes before it, okay. and that is that when you have a nus, you have an evidence 
a textual evidence. There is no room for any of the aspects of ijtihad. There is no aspect of looking at the urf because the urf is muhakkama in that, in that which the sharia did not provide a had for, did not provide a definition for or, or a limit for or a particular uh, ruling for. In this case, al-urf, the, the urf is muhakkama, no doubt. So we have the principle لَجْتِهَادَ مَعَ nas. There is no right to have, uh, to exercise legal judgment mm. in the face of textual evidence. So there are things in which Islam left it to urf and there are things in which Islam did not leave it to urf. And no doubt these hudud are hudud. They are, I mean, the very word had is something delimited and chosen yeah. and fixed. Okay, perfect. I'm going to just move on to some closing questions now and then I'll give you the chance if you'd like to take it to summarize what we've discussed on this uh, podcast today, inshallah. So the first question I have is that these punishments that we've spoken about that apply in the Muslim country with the Muslim government, I'm, I'm not talking about necessarily blasphemy or things like that, but I'm talking about theft, for example. Do they apply to non-Muslims living in that land as well? Yes, the rules of uh, of Islam apply to all those people who live uh, within that system, yani, who live in that system. So yes, it applies to the Ahlul Dhimma uh, and so on. Yani. And they may have some specific things that are unique to them. We mentioned the issue of uh, when we go outside of punishment, we talk about jizya and things like that. But broadly speaking, the the people of, of Ahlul Dhimma, they live within the rules of Islam and they have the safety that the Muslims are all are entitled to in terms of safety, security, protection and so on. Okay, would you advocate for Sharia law in the UK? I believe that the Islamic, again, this Sharia law is a, is a very negative, it's a very term that has a very negative connotation. I believe that the religion of Islam being implemented in the UK would bring nothing but good to the people of the UK. It would bring an increase in people's uh, safety and security. It would bring happiness to people. It would make people's hearts have tranquility because the Sharia is all of that. It's all, it's remembrance of Allah, it's the prayer, it's fasting. It's also about having strong punishments that deter people from crimes. I believe that it would bring nothing but good to any place in anywhere in the world. Okay, um, I want to thank you for your time, first of all, and give you the opportunity, if you'd like to summarize what we discussed, um, feel free, inshallah. Yeah, I think there are just a few things that I would like to sort of just bring people's attention back to. I think, first of all, that the Sharia is more than just punishments. I think that when we use the word sharia to, for punishments, we really give the impression that there isn't anything in Islam apart from punishing people for crimes. And really it's a tiny, tiny part of the religion of Islam. And it's an important part, but it's a tiny, tiny mm -hmm. part. And to look at that alone is really to give, uh, to, to make an imbalance. And it makes it seem like Muslims have no other concern except this. Really, the, the goal here, as we've mentioned many times, is deterrence, first of all. Mm -hmm. Deterrence and stopping people. You, one person goes through it, 100 people are saved because of it. The second thing is that there has to be appropriate retribution for crimes. There has to be a means of rehabilitation through Iman. Rehabilitation in this dunya and in the akhirah through Iman. Yes, there are times when someone has to be incapacitated, they have to be taken away from uh, the ability to to commit crimes again, and there are also issues of restoration, like things like blood money, whereby the the family uh, of the victim actually receives some kind of compensation and, and restoration for the crime that has been committed against them. These are all things that are recognised in Western legal systems as being important. But I believe that only Islam brings those things together and balances between them with the wisdom that is the infinite wisdom that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has. I would say that it's a big topic. I would say that it's difficult to cover everything yeah. in one topic. So I would say that if there are areas where we need to expand upon, we should do so. If there are things people would like to look more look into more about, they should do so because this is my uh, yani, uh, best ability to sort of just explain and clarify. But ultimately, uh, the whatever I say that is is correct is a blessing from Allah Azza wa Jal. And whatever I said that's wrong, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger وسلم, and the religion of Islam has nothing to do with that. So it is important that we give that disclaimer. Sure. And otherwise, I think that the more people look into this with a balanced, uh, a balanced uh, sort of approach and an open mind, they'll actually find that this 
like every part of Islam, is from the mahasin of Islam, the beautiful qualities of Islam, by which Islam is distinct from others, by which Islam brings to society what nothing else can bring. Jazakar khairan, Sheikh. Really appreciate it, sir. Wa yakum. It's been a pleasure. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Ashhadu wa la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilaik.